today for day two of the Open for Neuroscience Symposium and Tutorials. Good morning to our West Coast colleagues and good afternoon or evening to those of you joining us from other parts of the world. We have just a few housekeeping notes to cover before we get started today at the top of the hour. So first of all, we want to know who is joining us today. So please join in the conversation. Take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, share your name, your affiliation, and where you're calling in from today. The chat window is accessible from the bottom of your Zoom taskbar. Be sure to send your chats to all panelists and attendees. That way everyone can see your message. Good morning, Pamela from UC San Diego. Sunita from WashU, welcome. Again, for those of you just joining us, please take a moment, introduce yourself in the chat with your name and where you're calling in from today. As you continue to introduce yourselves, I have just a couple more housekeeping notes to share. We will be taking questions from the audience today. We ask that you submit your questions for presenters in the Q&A window, also accessible from the bottom of your Zoom taskbar. Um, we'll, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of each presentation, but you can submit a question at any time. Once you open that Q&A panel, just click to type your question in that window. Uh, please begin the question with the speaker's name so we know to whom it's directed and be sure to click send. If you are having connectivity issues today, we have a couple of helpful solutions. The first is that you can view the event through our YouTube live stream. You can access that by clicking the link in the Zoom chat, or you can also access the link from the same login details page where you found this symposium link on alleninstitute.org, or you can just go straight to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash alleninstitute and we will be taking questions from our YouTube viewers as well. You are also welcome to call in from your phone for better audio, so splitting the audio and video bandwidth on your main machine. Um, just switch to phone audio from the little carrot next to your mute button, the audio settings panel, you can click switch to phone audio and you will get that call in information. Here is a brief overview of our agenda for day two. Like yesterday, we'll hear from researchers at the Allen Institute and other institutions who, are, who have used Allen Brain Map resources in their work. But today, we'll be focused on the Allen Brain Observatory. We'll hear about some other data resources from Allen Institute for Brain Science tomorrow. If you missed yesterday's talks, they are all, all available on our YouTube channel as well. And as a reminder, at the end of each day of the program for the symposium, we will have a tutorial on how to use the resources that um, will be featured in the symposium portion and learn about what the Allen Brain Map can do for your research. Today's tutorial will be on the Allen Brain Observatory. And this tutorial will be accessible from a different Zoom link that's also on the login details page. Uh, no separate registration is required. Well, we hope you can stay for the entire program today. If you do have to step away, uh, we will be sharing a recording of most of today's talks um, on our YouTube channel after the event. We are going to get started right at the top of the hour. I'll do a couple more intros. We have Pedro from Western New Canada, Mary from WashU, other WashU attendee. Alejandro from UW, our neighbors here in Seattle, welcome. Rick Bourne from Boston, welcome back to day two. Okay, since we are at the top of the hour now, I'm happy to turn it over to our moderator for today, uh, co-chair of the Next Generation Leaders Council at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, Keith Hengen. Hello everybody, um, Megan and Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, Megan, thank you very much for the introduction. Welcome back to, uh, to, to day two of the Open for Neuroscience Symposium. We're really excited to have put this on. Um, and 
I was supposed to keep this introduction short. So basically today we're going to focus, we're going to move from sort of the cell types and sort of more of the sort of molecular side of things at the Allen into the uh, Allen Brain Observatory and MindScope. And in my view, I've told I might get some pushback on this, but I think that that is sort of the computational and systems side of things at the Allen. And that comprises data sets, tools, cool science projects within the Allen, and then also a bunch of science projects that use those data sets and tools that are outside of the Allen. So the idea here today is that we're gonna blend all of those things together. You'll hear about the science projects within and outside of the Allen, and then there'll actually be a workshop to introduce you on how to use some of those tools. So um, to get started here today, we'll hear from two of my favorite scientists, Saskia DeVries and Josh Siegel. Uh, they are both assistant investigators in the MindScope program at the Allen Institute, and they will be presenting an introduction to the Allen Brain Observatory. They will also be presenting the tutorial on the Allen Brain Observatory open data at the end of today's talks. So please make a note to log in at 11 a.m. Pacific time. It's about three hours from now. So Saskia, with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, Keith. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm excited to tell you about um, our data sets. Um, and so I, I'm gonna start and, and Josh will kind of follow up telling you about two of our, our primary data sets um, that we have made openly available through the MindScope program. I'm gonna tell you about our two photon calcium imaging data set for um, the Allen Brain Observatory visual coding data set. And then Josh will tell you about the NeuroPixels data set, uh, which is, these, these are two kind of complementary data sets that we're gonna be talking about throughout our session today. Um, we'll tell you about what these data sets are, and then a lot of people will tell you about some of the science that has been done using um, these open resources. Let's see. Right, so the, the idea in creating the Allen Brain Observatory data sets is, is in many ways essentially to create a survey of the visual activity in the mouse cortex. Um, and we wanted to be able to really start thinking about what these responses are and how they're being transformed in this circuit. Um, and to do this, we wanted to survey across different cortical areas. So on the left, I'm showing you an image of the surface of the, the, the mouse cortex. Uh, where you can see the primary visual cortex is this big kind of triangular wedge in the back that's surrounded by a number of higher visual areas, um, uh, secondary visual areas. Um, and so we wanted to be able to compare the, the activity in different visual areas. We wanted to compare the activity across different types of cells in different layers of the cortical circuit um, and use a wide range of different visual stimuli um, that allow us to really probe what these responses are and how the stimulus st statistics can affect it. Um, and so we created this data set with those types of questions in mind. How visual information is represented and transformed through the circuit? Um, are there differences in, across the different cortical areas and cortical layers and cell types? Um, and do we see that these stimulus statistics can affect the encoding properties of, of the neurons that we're uh, imaging? So for this data set, we collected the data using two photon calcium imaging. And I'll show you this movie here that Caitlin, can you get that to start? I think it's gonna give me trouble here. There we go. Uh, so this is just a movie from one experiment. You see the mouse's head fixed under a two photon microscope, um, but it's awake and it's free to run. There's no task that's involved in this particular experiment, but we do have the behavior of the, the running activity of the mouse. We're collecting data using calcium imaging. So we use transgenically expressed GCAMP6 um, that ex is expressed in particular populations of cells. Um, and so when different cells are active, the calcium floods into the cells, the indicator lights up, and we see different cells light up at different times during this experiment. We're um, showing a variety of different visual stimuli as you see on the far right. Some of them are things like this, at the end of this session, we see this noise stimulus, we've got natural movies, we've got drifting gratings. Um, and the whole time that we're doing these experiments, we're also tracking the eye position you see in the, the second to the right um, image in this movie. Um, this is a view of, of the eye that's pointed at the monitor and we can extract the pupil location it's circled here in red. Um, but that's what this red dot in our visualization is, is the position of the eye um, on the monitor during, during the experiment. For those of you who are you know, more familiar with say primate work, um, mice don't move their eyes as much as, as primates and humans do, um, but we do have this information tracked and available in, in our data set. So this is the basic modality that we're using in these experiments. Um, and 
Uh, we are able to collect this data using um, a high throughput um, data collection pipeline. Um, and so we've we've set up our, our, our operation system. We've got separate teams um, that carry out each st stage of the experiment. Uh, we've got teams that create our transgenic mice. We have a surgery team that um, creates the, the cranial window that gives us optical access to the brain and, and puts in this head post. Um, we have a team that creates a map of the visual area. So I showed you a couple slides ago where we could kind of outline the different visual areas on the surface of the cortex. We do this by creating um, an intrinsic signal imaging map. Um, we spend some time habituating the mice so that they're comfortable on uh, the experimental rig. And sorry, this control is, is eluding me. Um, after the mouse is comfortable and habituated, we then collect the data using our two photon imaging. Um, I showed you one example session for each group of cells that we image we will return to those same group of cells over three different days um, in order to use our full stimulus set because we do have a lot of different visual stimuli. And for each mouse, we typically will record from two or three different fields of view um, before we um, finish using that animal. After they're euthanized, we do some anatomical imaging, uh, which we can use to validate the expression of our, our calcium indicator more precisely, and as well as do um, uh, kind of history. A, a larger kind of uh, registration of, of the brain areas. So coming back to one of these experiments, um, I showed you kind of what this looks like in terms of, you know, we've got the running mouse, we've got the flashing uh, calcium activity. Um, we then have a data processing pipeline that takes these data, uh, these data streams and, as, and does a lot of the processing for it. So we do motion correction of our calcium imaging movie as well as cell identification and segmentation um, in order to extract the fluorescence traces of each, of each cell. Um, and so we can pull out the activity of, of each of the cells. Um, they're being plotted in this plot below. This is maybe 50 cells from one experiment. Um, we've got the timing information of the stimulus when each different frame of the stimulus is being shown. Um, that's being overlaid in cor coarsely here in terms of just different colors in the back of this plot. Um, we are extracting the eye position during, um, during the session as well as the running speed from the, the running disk that the mouse is on. And so we're able to extract all of these different streams of data um, and then we package them into a Neurodata Without Borders file. This is a standardized file format that we use that is made to kind of facilitate data sharing. Um, and this includes all of these data streams as well as a lot of rich metadata um, and other information as well. Um, so that then when this is, um, these NWB files are what we then share um, with the broader community um, and all of these, these pieces of data are then available. So over the course of a couple of years, we've collected um, a large number of data sets, over 1300 hours of calcium imaging from over 456 different fields of view um, that has, has gone into this two photon data set. Um, and this table gives you a, a little bit of an overview um, of the data that we've collected. Um, and I'm just gonna walk through it really quickly, but it, it gives you kind of a sense of what data we've collected, the, the total number of cells. So for the calcium imaging, we've got over 60,000 neurons from 456 different experiments. Each experiment again has three different imaging sessions. Um, and just to unpack this a little bit, you see that the data is collected across six different cortical brain areas. So we've got the primary visual cortex and then five of the higher visual corte uh, cortical areas that surround it. We've collected data in both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. We use um, specific Cree lines to target expression and I'll unpack those in a moment. Uh, we have collected data across different cortical layers. So spanning from layer two, three, all the way to layer six. Um, and uh, sometimes we use kind of broad expression where we have kind of pan excitatory expression across all of the layers and we can image it at different layers, or we use um, specific Cree lines that are specific to a particular layer or a subtype within a layer that gives us more specificity on the cell types that we're, we're imaging. Um, and so in total, we've used 14 different transgenic mouse lines. Um, I think the last detail to point out is the, the majority, the vast majority of the data in our data set was collected using GCAMP6 FAST, um, but there are some, uh, some data sets were collected using GCAMP6 SLOW, and so that's been indicated here as well. Um, and so you can see kind of how we've sampled this. Again, not every Cree line was imaged across all six areas. Um, so it's a bit of a, of a sampling of this, this large space, um, but we have this, this very large data set, very rich data set that results from this. Um, so I mentioned before, we used 14 different transgenic Cree lines. So Cree is a transgenic tool that we leverage in the mouse that allows us to limit the expression, to target the expression of our calcium indicator in a particular population of neurons. 
Um, and so we've used um, these different Cree lines to target the expression into particular cell types. As I mentioned before, some of them are broad panexcitatory lines that label across all of the layers um, that give very broad expression. And we image these at different imaging depths. Um, other Cree lines are specific either to a, a, a layer in general um, or to subpopulations within a layer. So for instance, in layer five, we've got a cortical fugal projecting FESF um, Cree line, and then a cortical cortical projecting neurons in the TLX line that give us different subpopulations within that layer. And one of the big advantages of these Cree lines is that especially for these deeper layers in layer five and layer six, we really only get good optical access when we limit the expression of our calcium indicator to that layer, um, to, the, to the cells that are just in that layer um, exclusively. These are the excitatory Cree lines here on the left. On the right, I'm showing the inhibitory Cree lines where we've targeted kind of the three large populations of VIP, somatostatin, and parvalbumin cells. Um, you can tell from these images that these are much sparser lines. And so for um, our excitatory cells, a typical field of view will have several hundred, like, you know, 200 cells, um, sometimes more in the superficial layers, three or 400 cells in a field of view. For the inhibitory cells, it's, it's more like 12 um, in our standard field of, field of view, just because it's a much sparser, um, it's a much sparser line. Um, as, as, and I mentioned earlier, we use a rich set of visual stimuli. These include some of, some kind of you know, traditional stimuli, including gratings. We've got drifting gratings that move in eight different directions and at five different temporal frequencies. Static gratings that, uh, where we flash the gratings at different orientations and spatial frequencies. So we change the period of the, of the grating. We use a locally sparse noise where we've got spots of light and black that are flashed in different positions on the monitor, which give us maps of the spatial receptive fields. We have a set of natural images that are flashed natural images. So one image after the other, um, and then a set of natural movies, um, a couple of different clips um, taken from the movie Touch of Evil um, that have both natural scene statistics, but also um, the temporal correlations as well. And then every experimental session has at least five minutes of spontaneous activity where we've just got the mean luminance of the monitor um, held for five minutes to get that, that spontaneous um, activity. I mentioned earlier, um, in order to use all of these stimuli, we break the experiment into three different imaging sessions. Each imaging session is one hour in duration. So we come back to the same field of view on three different days. You can see this is the max projection from um, three different days of, of imaging the same group of cells. And you can see this is really well matched across days, but it's not perfect. There's some cells that are more active in one session than the other. So we don't always find the exact same set of cells from one day to the next, but we do have a very high overlap um, in identifying the cells. And each, um, because of how these are done, um, for each experimental session, we have a single NWB file for each separate session. So if you're looking at the data for all of these stimuli for a particular cell, you're actually going to be looking across several different files um, to, to deal with that data. So we also have a software kit, and Josh and I are going to do a tutorial at the end of our, our workshop today um, that will introduce you to the software kit that allows you to access these data and has some tools that help you start um, analyzing uh, these data. Um, and so this is available to really kind of facilitate you um, being able to easily find the data that you're looking that you're looking to use with this. Um, so I just want to point you to more information. Um, this is a screenshot from our website where you can kind of explore um, these data in, in greater detail. We've got some rich visualizations that summarize the visual responses as well as some of the experiment, uh, experiment population-wide um, metrics. Um, but some of the key things there are information on the software kit that I've circled here on the left um, and how to install that and get started with it. Um, as well as on the right, I've circled a link for a documentation which um, will lead you to um, a several set of, of white papers that we produce that describe the experimental procedures, the transgenic tools that we use, um, and kind of how we've processed and analyzed this data um, that in the analysis that's made kind of readily available. Um, there's always more analysis that, that, that everyone can do for, on their own um, with the data as well, but we've done some preliminary analyses and we outline that in this one of these white papers. So, you know, in the couple of years that this data set's been available, there have been a few dozen um, papers um, that have come out, um, both from internal scientists at the Allen Institute, as well as from external users. And I think you're, you're going to hear um, 
there's we have three external speakers that are, are speaking later today about work they've done using these data sets and and I, I think actually all of them are represented on this this slide um, potentially um, but there's a lot of interesting work that's being done and it ranges from people uh, actually taking the raw calcium movies and looking at methods for identifying cells or matching cells across different days um, as well as people looking at population level decoding or um, uh, you know methods for um, uh, you know, analyzing these these visual responses on single cells and, and populations as well. I'm going to highlight uh, just in this case our, our platform paper where we introduce the data set. You'll hear more from Michael about this, uh, Michael Bice, in in a in a little bit. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but you know, we 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 began to kind of unpack some of the, the the phenomena that we're seeing in the data sets and making these comparisons. And so we can look at different types of properties and compare them um, across different these different dimensions that we've introduced. You know, we've put into um, this data set, right? Um, and so, for instance, we can look at um, individual cells. We can look at particular response properties, and in, in this case, direction selectivity. Uh, this is a metric that says how strongly a cell prefers motion in one direction compared to the opposite direction. Um, and this visualization on the left, we call this a pop plot. It allows us to compare the values um, across different across the different visual areas. So we've got V1 and then the five higher visual areas that surround it. And then we've reproduced this plot for each layer. So layer two, three, layer four, layer five, and layer six. Um, and that the color now is kind of the median value of, of the cells that are in, in each area. And so you can see a little bit of an organization of direction selectivity where we see stronger direction selectivity in, in V1 and particularly in layer four of V1. Um, and then the direction selectivity is actually weaker in, in the higher visual areas, which was something that, that surprised us um, somewhat. Um, and you can then on the right is a plot that just summarizes within V1, just looking across all of the different Cree lines. Again, you see this enhanced direction selectivity in layer four compared to the, the more superficial and deeper layers um, in the excitatory populations. Um, so that's looking at a single cell metric. We can also look at kind of population um, analyses. So we've done some um, stimulus decoding where we um, see how well we can de uh, determine what stimulus condition was presented based off of the activity of all of the neurons in the population. Again, summarizing that decoding performance across different areas and layers and uh, um, across populations of different cell types um, in this in this bar plot on the right. Um, and in, in many ways, the, the decoding performance for decoding the, the grading stimulus largely mirrors the, the direction selectivity of the individual cells, um, though it's actually not a perfect correlation there. Um, another type of analysis, another type of uh, property that we can look at is the variability of the responses. So one of the things that we found in our data set was that the responses to repeated presentations of the same stimulus for individual cells was not very reliable in our, our data set. Um, here's one metric that, that that measures that is looking at the coefficient of variation. Um, we see it's actually fairly high for most of our excitatory cells. These it's somatostatin inhibitory neurons actually are the most reliable of the cell populations that we image where they've, they actually have pretty robust and consistent responses across trials. Um, and then another example, we can you know, ignore the visual stimulus altogether and simply think about the, the neural activity and how it relates to the running speed of the mouse. And so this is just looking at the correlation of the activity of, um, of individual neurons uh, to the running speed of, of the mouse. Um, again, summarizing that correlation across different areas um, and then across different cell types, we see strongest correlation of activity in, in V1, um, except in layer five, where then we see that it's pretty consistent across the different visual areas. Um, and then if you, we look across the cell types, um, and perhaps not surprising, we see that VIP has kind of the strongest correlation with uh, the mouse's running speed, but um, really somatostatin cells also do too um, as well. It's, it's a layer to three VIP cells that actually have that strongest correlation and the other VIP cells that are in deeper layers are, are still correlated, but a little less uh, as, as, as and less prominently. Um, so this is just to kind of give you a, a flavor of the types of ways that we can think about this data as individual cells or large populations or looking at the behavior as opposed to the to, to the visual stimuli, um, just to emphasize how kind of many dimensions there are in this data set and the, the, the different types of possibilities for, for working with this data. Um, but you'll hear a lot more from, from our other speakers about um, the analyses that are being done with this. So at this point, I'm going to wrap up and turn it over to Josh so he can tell you about the NeuroPixels data set. Um, but I want to thank our entire team. There's a large group of people, over 100 people that have contributed to collecting and processing and um, organizing and analyzing this data set. Um, and as everything we do at the Allen Institute is a team science, um, it's always um, amazing to see kind of what happens with this type of, of, of large team structure. 
Um, and then finally, thank Paul Allen for his vision, encouragement, and support in, in making um, this type of work possible. So I um, let me know, let me see if there are any questions. I actually don't see the. Here's Saskia. I can I can read this off to you. So you answered a couple of the questions just as a function of your talk. But uh, Richard Bourne asks, basically, I'm going to combine these into one. Do you do any variation of contrast? And then also, have you compared receptive field size when correcting for eye, eye movements versus not correct? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, in this data set, there's no, um, we didn't vary contrast. Um, we do have um, a, a data set that it's it's not in, in the same mechanism, but it's the data's up on Dandy, um, where we did look at the responses where we did use contrast as a key variable. Um, again, looking across different visual areas, it's not as large. We didn't. We looked at six visual areas, but not as many layers, not as many Cree lines. So um, we have some data on that. And I think there's some neuropixels data about contrast tuning as well. Um, in terms of um, correcting for eye position. So in our basic analysis, we ended up not um, incorporating the eye position into um, our receptive field mapping because when we, we did with a kind of a subset of the data, we did do that pretty rigorously and we found that it had pretty minimal effects. So the mouse eye movements are about five to 10 degrees and they're all mostly horizontal movements like this. Um, and it, it can affect some receptive fields. Um, and what we found is, you know, some receptive fields get slightly larger when you actually correct for that eye position and some of them actually get a little bit smaller. And so when we actually did this on a population scale, we didn't see um, a, re a real large um, impact on, on the receptive fields that we measured. So um, for the, the measurements that we did, we did not um, do that correction um, systematically, but because we found that it didn't have a, a very large effect on, on what we were finding. Cool, um, let's we'll get, get one more in here for you. Um, so the, the Cree lines, uh, so for the Cree lines that are sparse, can you clarify if it's that only a fraction of the cells of that type express their border or that there are a small number of those cells? It's that there's a small number of those cells. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so these inhibitory cells, they're just, there's not as many of the inhibitory cells that are, are present there. And so uh, we typically get, you know, about a dozen cells in our field of view. Um, and that's because that's what's there. I mean, I'm sure there's some, you know, I'm sure there's a little bit of not every cell is being labeled perfectly that's also going on. And that's true with all of the Cree lines that we have. Um, but the, the reason it's so sparse is, is, is really just because they're this, the cells themselves are sparser. Okay, so there, there are some more questions, but I think we should, in the interest of time, let, let yeah. Josh. Thanks a lot, uh, Keith and Saskia. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the um, NeuroPixels version of the Allen Brain Observatory. Um, this is a uh, similar set of experiments that is complementary to the two photon experiments that uh, Saskia just told you about. Uh, so if you haven't heard of NeuroPixels probes. These are a, a new type of silicon probe that's used to record electrical activity from the brain. Uh, these were probes that were developed by the Allen Institute in collaboration with a, a few other um, research institutes uh, like uh, HHMI Genelia and University College London. Uh, and they were designed and manufactured by IMEC in Belgium. Uh, and these probes have really, um, revolutionized our ability to record spiking activity from many different parts of the brain at once. Uh, they pack almost a thousand recording sites onto a 10 millimeter shank. And so they really increase the yield of electrophysiology experiments. And uh, as you'll see, we can insert multiple probes into the brain simultaneously. And uh, this gives us the uh, ability to record from uh, many different regions of the mouse brain at once. Uh, so we're using these probes to uh, collect data in a high throughput standardized way. Uh, so basically the, the mice go through the initial set of steps that are identical to the um, steps in the two photon brain observatory. But um, after the habituation step, the pipelines uh, pipeline split and uh, some of the mice go to electrophysiology. And uh, in this case, we're interested in many of the same questions that uh, the two photon imaging pipeline was designed to address. So we want to know how information is represented throughout the mouse uh, visual system. And we want to know if there are is functional specialization 
of particular brain regions uh, in terms of how they represent visual information. Um, but with the electrophysiology data, we're able to um, we're able to access the neural activity at a much finer temporal resolution. So we can easily resolve single spikes with sub millisecond precision. And uh, as you can kind of see in this, this little graphic, um, we are inserting six probes into the, into the brain at once. So we get simultaneous activity from uh, six different cortical regions as well as subcortical regions. So um, it's kind of a, a, a nice complementary perspective to what we're getting from two-photon imaging and allows us to answer uh, a, a different set of scientific questions. So this is an image of the, the rig that we use for these experiments. Uh, it was modeled after the, the two-photon imaging rig, but we've replaced the two-photon microscope with uh, six probes, which can be independently manipulated to be targeted to specific brain regions. Um, you can see on the right, there's the, the visual display that is uh, showing the stimuli to the mouse and the mouse is free to run on a rotating disc. Um, so the, the mouse is, is head fixed, but uh, they can choose to, to run or, or stay stationary at, at any point during the, the experiment. We're also monitoring their eye as well as their body using, using cameras. Um, and so, yeah, this is the, um, this is the hardware that, that we use for these experiments. Um, the target areas in cortex are the same as the ones that were used for the two photon imaging experiments. So uh, we use intrinsic signal imaging to map out the, um, the surface of the mouse visual cortex, and we can see the boundaries of these different areas. And then we target individual neuropixels probes to each of these areas. And uh, as you can see, the, the probes are quite long. So we're able to record from all layers simultaneously. So within any given layer, we don't get uh, to record as many cells as you would in a uh, imaging experiment, but we can monitor the activity of all layers simultaneously. And we can do this across up to, to six cortical areas. And then the, because the probes are so long, we can insert them down into the thalamus as well. So we record from lateral geniculate nucleus, which receives direct input from the retina, as well as LP, which uh, receives input from uh, cortex as well as superior colliculus. Uh, and so we're recording from many different nodes in this in the mouse visual system simultaneously. And so that gives us access to information about their interactions and, and how information is flowing through the system. Um, and across many experiments, uh, you can see that we're kind of densely sampling this, this uh, uh, part of the mouse brain that includes the, these visual areas as well as hippocampus and, and thalamus. So um, it's not shown in the cartoon on the left, but um, all of these probes are also passing through hippocampus. And so we have many, many cells simultaneously recorded from, from that region as well. So this is an example of a, a spike raster from one experiment. So all, all these areas uh, in, in a number of experiments are being recorded simultaneously. And so um, here you can see kind of the responses to this drifting grading stimulus, just the, the phase of the, the stimulus is, is shown as these wavy lines on the top. And then um, you can see that most of these visual areas are, are responding to the stimulus onset. Um, and then we also have information from the hippocampus here. This is just the, uh, hip, uh, the LFP signal, the local field potential from the hippocampus showing the prominent theta oscillation. Uh, we're also tracking the mouse's running speed as well as the, the pupil diameter. So um, we get these rich multimodal data sets uh, that we can mine for uh, interesting discoveries. So the stimulus uh, that was shown, um, there are actually two different sets of stimuli that were shown in different experiments. Uh, first one was uh, basically repeating many of the stimuli that were shown in the two photon imaging experiments. And this was done um, A, because it's a, a nice diverse set of stimuli that gives us a lot of information about what the cells in the brain are responding to. And B, it gives us the opportunity to uh, directly compare the activity recorded in the imaging experiments with that from the electrophysiology experiments. And there's gonna be a talk uh, in a little bit by Peter uh, where he will discuss some of our findings in that regard. Um, so yeah, we've basically taken two of the imaging sessions from 
uh, or two of the, the stimulus sets from the, the two photon imaging sessions concatenated them together, added a slightly different receptive field mapping stimulus, and then we show that all in, in, one, um, in one session. One of the differences between uh, imaging and electrophysiology is well, we're doing these recordings acutely. Uh, these probes are not permanently implanted in, in the mouse brain, so uh, we can only record uh, a particular cell within one session. So we basically have to get all the data for each cell uh, from one session. Um, and so we try to, to fit as many stimuli as possible into, into that one session. So um, we also have a, a somewhat complementary stimulus set that omits the static gratings and the natural images, um, and then um, adds a um, dot motion stimulus as well as uh, contrast tuning stimulus. Um, I think someone asked, asked that or, uh, about that earlier. Um, and so, yeah, this again is, is all concatenated into one session. And, and this also includes a, a longer 30 minute period of, of gray screen. So we can look at spontaneous fluctuations and how information propagates between areas when there's no stimulus on the screen. So this is just an example of uh, response of, of one cell to uh, a flash stimulus, which is another type of stimulus that we show where the, the screen just turns from gray to white or from gray to black. Um, and here you can see the very fine temporal resolution that we get. So um, you can see very clear differences between the response of this cell to the light flash versus the dark flash. Um, and um, differences uh, on this time scale would, would be washed out in the two photon imaging data. Um, but we, we see them very clearly with our, our spike raster. Um, and then here's a drifting grading response uh, where you can see here's a, a raster for each combination of temporal frequency and direction at which these gradings were shown. And then we summarize this in, in a star plot similar to what was used in the, the two photon experiments. Um, and here, yeah, you can, you can very clearly see this, this cell is strongly direction tuned and, and also has some, some tuning to temporal frequency. Um, a very important stimulus that we use is the receptive field mapping stimulus. So um, in order to figure out what region of visual space the cell is responding to, we flash these um, circular gratings at different locations on the screen, random uh, times on each uh, throughout, the, throughout the stimulus presentation. And um, then for any given location on the screen, we can create a spike raster. Um, it, it responds to the, the 45 presentations of the stimulus in that location. Um, and then we, if we look across these uh, different locations in um, azimuth and elevation, we can see this, this cell is, is very clearly responding to a particular region of space. And then we use these PSDHs to create a receptive field, which is basically a, a heat map of, of where, the, um, where in visual space the cell is responding to. Um, and then if we do that for all the cells in our data set, we can see these smoothly varying maps of, of visual space. So and this is something that, it, that we see all the time in our intrinsic imaging studies, uh, but it's nice to see that if, if you aggregate across activity of individual cells, you, you also see these maps both in, in cortex as well as in, in thalamus. So we have a lot more details about the experiments as well as some scientific findings in this, this paper that recently came out in Nature. Uh, I think Xiaoxin in, in her talk in a little bit will um, discuss some of these findings. Um, but this, uh, these experiments really just scratch the surface of, of what's possible with this data set. Um, and yeah, there's so many other angles and, and interesting questions that you can ask uh, using this, um, using this rich large scale data set. Um, and there are already uh, a number of preprints and publications that are coming out uh, using this data. Um, this, uh, these are uh, some that, that we know about that uh, the, the data set was only released in, in October, 2019, um, but there are already quite a few publications that make use of this data set. Um, uh, here's a, uh, another set of, of publications that have come out more recently. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are things that use the data for everything from validating new methodologies to um, mining the data for interesting scientific results. There's, there's a very um, broad range of, of different uses for, for this data. Um, and so if you are interested in, in accessing it yourself, um, there are 
um, many resources for, for learning more about it. Um, so definitely want to check out the, the documentation at lnsdk.readathedocs.io. Uh, if you are trying to access the data and you get stuck in some way or have any, any questions, uh, definitely encourage you to ask, uh, ask them on the Allen Brain Map community forum. Uh, it's a very active discussion forum where um, basically uh, any, any question is fair game. Um, and in order to access the data, uh, we, we recommend doing it via the Allen SDK, which is a, a Python library, uh, which if you are able to, uh, I definitely recommend attending the tutorial that, that Saskia and I will be running later today, uh, where we'll, we will walk you through all the, the steps required to, um, to browse through the data via the Allen SDK, download it, and, and perform some simple analyses. Uh, but if you're using Python, you can just use uh, pip to, to install an Allen SDK, and you will uh, then have access to data from 58 sessions, uh, almost 100,000 units, um, and um, yeah, can begin to um, begin to perform your own, own analyses on, on this data set. So yeah, I want to thank everyone involved in, in this study. Uh, it would, as yeah, Saskia said, um, there were so many people who, who contributed in, in essential ways. For, yeah, definitely over a hundred people who um, who helped out with this project. Uh, both the the people who set up the two photon imaging experiments, with, which really laid the groundwork for the NeuroPixels pipeline, uh, as well as all the people who were instrumental in developing NeuroPixels probes and uh bringing um bringing those into the world uh and then all the the people who collected analyzed the data uh built the rigs uh built the the software infrastructure for um for disseminating the data um and all the people who managed the projects and they, yeah there's a huge huge array of of people who helped out with this and um really showcasing what the allen institute is all about which is team science So yeah, I think we have some time for questions. Sure, Josh, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so the, the first question is from Richard Bourne and he's asking, is, is the data that you are showing from sorted unique spikes? Yeah, so uh, we have a, a data processing pipeline that starts with the raw data, which sampled at 30,000 Hertz. And that is passed through a spike sorter called Kilosort. Um, and then we take the output of, of Kilosort and um, do some quality control to figure out which, which uh, cells are highest quality and, and uh, attach quality metrics to all of the, the sorted spikes. Uh, and then what gets packaged in the NWB file is the, the spike times for individual units. And, and that's what we use for the majority of our analysis. Of course, we also have lots of interesting analyses we can do with local field potential. Um, but yeah, the most of what we've done so far has been with the spike times. Cool. So the, the next two questions kind of come together. So I'm going to try to package them as one. So the, the, the first is from Pamela and she says, Josh, it looks like the stimuli change fairly often every one to two seconds and are repeated fairly few times. Can you say something about data sets involving long presentations for looking at adaptation or repeated lots of times for looking at reliability? And then the next question is basically asking, um, how, how basically how much do you think that uh, experience with a stimulus affects its encoding? So is a, is a novel stimulus or an unexpected stimulus going to be encoded differently than one that is highly familiar to the animal? Yeah, so those are great questions. Um, so we we were actually also concerned about the, the limited number of, of presentations per trial in the original stimulus set. Um, I, there's still enough to, to do lots of interesting analyses, but uh, we designed this specific functional connectivity stimulus set to include more repeats of, of each stimulus type. I think each uh, drifting grading in that in that stimulus set is presented 75 times. And so that gives you the opportunity to, to look at uh, kind of reliability over, over a higher number of trials. Um, and then the, what was the second question? Uh, basically getting at, Within the context of reliability, how much do you think, and this is, I'm also projecting a bit of my own thought on this, does this familiarity or repetition or expectedness of a stimulus actually affect its intrinsic encoding? So if you have something that's familiar versus novel or unexpected, would that change the underlying encoding? 
Yeah, so um, I mean, this is something that we're kind of looking at explicitly in our uh, visual behavior pipeline. Uh, so that, that data is not released yet, but um, that should be coming out soon where you have uh, mice performing a explicit change detection task where you have a stimulus that's repeated and then at some point uh, it randomly swi switches and the mouse has to detect that switch. And so that allows us to look at how these novelty signals are, are propagated through the brain. And, and there's some of this analysis in the, the Nature paper that, that just came out. Uh, I also know of, of, a, of a few um, preprints using this data set that are, are explicitly looking at the, the effects of, of adaptation to the stimulus. So um, yeah, if you check out the, the list of, of preprints that was in the, um, that, that was in the slides, um, there, there are a few that are, are looking at this, this question explicitly. Cool, I really, I really like that idea that, that the, the, the context of a stimulus could actually change even the primary sensory cortices encoding of it potentially. But cool, I look forward to those papers. Um, I think that that wraps up those questions. Uh, Saskia and Josh will be available to answer questions by, by keyboard if any more pop up. But with that, we're perfectly on time to move to our next speaker, uh, Michael Bice, um, uh, and, and, and a team of scientists from the Allen. Um, Michael is an assistant investigator with the MindScope program at the Allen Institute, and he will be presenting functional computation in the mouse visual cortex, which is near and dear to my heart. So I'm very excited to hear what you have to say, Michael. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Keith. Um, so, after the, uh, the, the awesome introductions to these, these fairly excellent and large data sets, uh, I'm gonna try to start uh, thinking about how we can use these data sets to uh, start imagining getting to what the overall computation in the circuit is. So uh, the first order question would be, can we use these data sets to characterize the functional properties and say you know, there's a, a certain type of cell that responds to certain types of stimuli uh, and that they have this distribution of properties and so forth. Uh, but I want to step back a little bit and think about what the overall function of the circuit is. So one of our, our many motivations uh, uh, for collecting these types of data is thinking about computations like the one that's displayed on the, the, the slide here, where in, in primate, we have this idea that the ventral stream performs object recognition, at least in some sense, uh, where there's this, a sequence of, of computations that go through various areas, starting at, at, at you know, from the retina to LGN to V1, and where V1 you get responses to sort of low level features uh, like a wavelet basis, so decomposition of images. And then in V2 and V4, you get more, more complicated uh, uh, combinations of, of different features. So by the time you get to infratemporal cortex, you have response to object properties. Uh, and this is often modeled with a, a convolutional neural network. So our first question is, is there some parallel construction? Can we start characterizing the responses in this way and relate it to some kind of computation uh, that the whole circuit is doing? Uh, and so if you, you go back uh, in your mind 15, 20 minutes uh, to Saskia pointing out that, that we actually have a lot of variability in this data. So one of the first things we tried to do is associate the different kinds of stimulus responses uh, across the different stimuli. And so we did a, 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 taking this measurement of reliability, we did a Gaussian mixture model clustering on uh, the different sets of, of reliability, uh, excuse me, on the different uh, responses. Uh, and we get the following, uh, the following assignment of the, the different cells in the two photon data set. And so to decode the, the image you see before you, uh, D, G, and S, G are drifting grading and static grading. Uh, N, M, and N, S are natural movies and natural, uh, natural scenes. Uh, and the, the designations in each group are the set of stimuli to which the, the neurons in that group were uh, reliably responsive. And so over here on the right, uh, you see that the, uh, the, the, the sort of the all cells, the cells that respond to everything, and it's about 10% of the total data set. And there's some other prominent groups, uh, things like the, the natural movies and drifting grading natural movies. These are the, th the cells that respond to motion. And collectively, this is something like 20% of the cells. And even a significant group that responds to, to just natural things, natural scenes and natural movies, which is again about 12%. Uh, but the elephant in the room is the thing that I've, I've ignored talking through this entire slide, which is over here on the left, you see this giant bar uh, for none cells. These are the cells that responded reliably to none of our stimuli. Uh, and this is the clear plurality of, of the data set. It's about a third of the data set uh, that didn't respond. Now, there's some, uh, 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 an interesting uh, 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 distribution here in that if you look at these over the different higher order visual areas, you can sort of define an ordering by how many none cells exist. And so you can imagine there's some kind of hierarchy uh, 
uh, at least putting together these, these, these nun cells uh, where you have the smallest number in B1 and so you have this enormous number in RL. Uh, also interesting to note is that you have approximately the same number of motion responsive cells or same proportion, I should say, of motion responsive cells across most of these areas. So what we wanted to do was actually get a, a sort of, see if we get some sort of model that's predictive, right? This is just saying something about which stimuli the neurons responded to, but stepping back a bit, uh, you know, we wanna be able to say, okay, if I have a neuron and, it, and I'm gonna show it this stimulus, can I do something to predict the response? And so the place we wanted to start was thinking about what we've been calling the standard model, uh, which is the standard sort of neuro, uh, in, in visual physiology, the idea that you have sort of simple responses and complex responses. And so we defined this wavelet GLM, uh, where the, the features of the GLM were based on a dense wavelet, um, the density of uh, spatial temporal wavelets, uh, the density of that wavelet basis being determined by what we understood the mouse visual and temporal acuities to be. Um, so as far as the mouse was able to respond uh, to certain features in a visual scene, we should be able to reproduce that with our wavelet basis, reproduce a stimulus of the same type. Uh, and we had both linear and quadratic basis functions, which should reproduce simple and complex behaviors. And in addition, we, we, we added the, the um, mouse's running speed, since we know that there, there's some uh, observations of, of running responses uh, in cortex. And we asked, can we use this model, train it, and we trained it separately on the natural stimuli and the artificial stimuli, um, and, and use that to predict the, um, the neural activity. So the results here over the, the, the majority of the data set uh, are plotted where I, what I've plotted is the uh, cross-validated uh, prediction in, in class prediction uh, on the vertical axis. You have the, the models that were trained and tested on natural scenes or natural stimuli. And on the, the horizontal axis, the, the models that were trained and tested on artificial stimuli. And again, this is the cross-validated correlation of the model prediction versus the, uh, the actual neural response. And you see that the, you know, based on the density here, the vast majority uh, of cells are way down here at a correlation of zero. In fact, if you just look at natural stimuli alone, it's something like 2% of the cells have a correlation value above 0.5. Uh, now, thankfully, this corresponds to our, our clustering, our functional clustering. So if I take the cells, to, so if you look at the plot over on the left-hand side here, if I take the cells out of that same plot and I highlight just the ones that are in the none class, that's a nice uh, cluster sitting around zero, which is what you'd expect for cells that supposedly did not respond reliably. Uh, in the middle plot, I've highlighted the cells that just responded well to the natural scenes and natural movies. And sure enough, that's another cluster that's sitting on the vertical axis, which is, again, what you'd expect. Uh, and finally, if I highlight the cells that responded reliably to everything, that's a nice cluster that's sort of in the, the territory that we expected. Um, so for example, uh, 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 the phrase, uh, a good start, uh, was used to describe these models. Um, this is what we expected. These are the, this is the sort of area that we expected the results for most of the data set to, to fall in. Uh, and then we could start thinking about how to modify the models in terms of other kinds of nonlinear effects and, and things that people study in, in visual neuroscience. Uh, but in fact, instead of seeing this, this right-hand plot for most of the data, we actually wind up with these, these cells that don't do anything. There's sort of a dark matter problem, if you will. Um, and you might be thinking, so everything I've been talking about so far has been two photon calcium imaging. Um, you might think, okay, this is a two photon problem. Maybe if you do this with spikes, you get a different result. And in fact, that's not true. Uh, so here I've, I've plotted these, these distributions of, of cross-validated prediction values for this particular model uh, for several different data sets. The, brain, the two photon brain observatory is the, the row on the bottom. Uh, the top is using neuropixels with a, a set of dense movies, natural movies. Uh, and the middle is a different two photon experiment with different uh, natural movies. And they all show a, a population of cross-validated prediction uh, correlations in the range of about 0.2. So one of the reasons for this, and I'll justify this by a, a different analysis in a moment, uh, is we think you're, we're just simply getting very, very sparse responses uh, to very uh, particular uh, you know, sparse features in the natural scenes, uh, particular spatiotemporal features. And so based on this hypothesis, we're trying to extend this data set. We've actually just finished collecting a, a data set where we're trying to return to the same cells day after day after day after day over about 10 sessions uh, with hundreds of minutes of unique natural movie frames. Uh, one of the things we were not able to do based on that, that sparsity hypothesis uh, is fit complex models, things that are more, uh, things, things that are uh, uh, deeper in the deep learning sense 
uh, than just a simple GLM. And so we've tried to fit, for example, multi multi-layer convolutional models that would predict the neural response. And those models all overfit on the, the initial brain observatory data set. With this new data set, we have a pilot study, for example, that shows that if I fit a multi-layer convolutional model uh, and I compare the results of that to, the, to a model that's equivalent to the model I just described, you actually get improved performance, which is suggestive of, of the idea that this really is some, some higher order sparse computation uh, that's going on. But I'm gonna justify that in a slightly different way. So I, I use the motivation of, of these convolutional nets in the primate ventral stream initially uh, as part of our, our motivation for, for talking about this functional characterization. So I think it's reasonable to ask what one should have expected um, with such a model. And so what I've shown here, uh, this is the architecture of VGG16, which is a, an image net winner. Uh, one of the, the sort of famous uh, uh, convolutional nets that does object recognition on the ImageNet data set. Uh, and what's been plotted here are the optimal, the optimal driving stimuli for a handful of units in each of these layers that are indicated. And you can see that you go from relatively simple features to when you're most of the way through the network, you have this sort of psychedelic crazy uh, uh, set, sets of, of stimuli um, that drive the cells. And so here's where you're getting your sparse, very strange features. So if you take the 119 natural images, for example, that were shown in the brain observatory two photon set, uh, and you show this to VGG16, the percentage of images that generate a response uh, actually goes down as you go through the network. So this is, this is you know, corresponding to the idea that the network itself is generating uh, uh, responses to sparser features that are appropriate for the task that it's being trained to do. And so you might ask the question, well, is this, what's hap is this kind of thing what's happening with the mouse that you get this sparse feature computation? So what we want to do is compare the representation we get in something like VGG16 to the, um, uh, the representations, meaning the population responses that we get in um, the Allen Brain Observatory. And the way we're going to do that is use what's called a similarity matrix analysis. So with a similarity matrix, what you do is you show an image, you get a population response, you show another image, you get another population response, and you correlate those two. Across all pairs of images, you get this matrix um, of correlation values of the population response, and that's your representation. That's what you call a similarity matrix, and you correlate that matrix across the different things you want to compare. So some layer of VGG, for example, versus a, um, an area of the brain observatory. Now, one question you have to ask is, can you, and this, this, this uh, I should say this, this uh, metric is essentially mo modeling, or it's a way of capturing how image space is transformed into the neural space. So, so two, two images that produce similar responses will have a high correlation. And so it tells you sort of which images are near each other in some sense. Um, so one question you have to ask is, can you model this space or map this space very well using 119 images and having only a subset of neurons? Because we're obviously not measuring all the neurons in the brain observatory or in the, in the mouse visual cortex with the brain observatory. And so we had to ask this question before we get asked the comparison question. So statement one is that even if you use a small number of in images around the size of the brain observatory, you can use VGG16 as a benchmark for itself. So you can reliably correlate the correct layer of VGG16 with itself, even if you only show it 120 images. And a similar statement applies if you subsample units from VGG16, uh, namely a number of units that's similar to the, um, the number that, that we actually measured in the mouse visual cortex. And so this is a, we can ask a consistent question using VGG16 as a benchmark to ask sort of what layer is the right layer uh, as the closest layer, if you will, to the mouse visual cortex. And so if we ask that question, we wind up uh, uh, with the result that the layers that are best matched are the, are the deeper layers, the, the layers whose feature, whose optimal features are closer to those psychedelic features rather than to the very simple features. Um, that's statement one. Things look very uh, uh, relatively complex and sparse in that sense. Statement two that's interesting from this is, so, so these dots that I've not described in previous slides, the solid dot indicates the best matched layer. The lighter dots indicate layers that are statistically indistinguishable from that one. And so you, you notice uh, in the previous slides, there was like a single layer, which is what I meant by saying that, that the, um, or was my justification for saying we could uniquely identify the corresponding layer. In, in this case, comparing from VGG16 to the Brain Observatory, we can't uniquely identify a layer. We just know that they're the deeper layers and some of them are very complex. So you're fitting feature or you're, you're matching feature responses that cover many of the layers, uh, which suggests of course that, or one reading of this is that uh, object recognition is not the right type of, uh, of task to be using. Um, and so 
perhaps there's some other task which, for which a network train would be more aligned with what the mouse is doing. Now, something that um, I should add here is VGG16 is not special here. It's a thing we used for this metric, uh, but you can take any uh, off the shelf pre trained image net convolutional neural network and you'll get qualitatively similar results. So, this is not special to the model we picked. Uh, so, in summary, about a third of our cells didn't resp respond reliably to our stimuli. Uh, the standard model predicts activity in very, very few cells. Uh, and it looks like things in the, in the sense of measuring against a deep convolutional network, uh, mouse responses are, are much more sparse and sort of higher order uh, in that sense. So with that, I want to thank all of the people who are involved in the analysis work and building the pipelines and, and putting all of this together. And of course, Paul Allen for making this all possible. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, I enjoyed that. I hope you did too. Uh, so we have, we have a couple questions. Um, the first is from Pamela and Pamela asks, uh, Michael, the, the GLM standard model results you showed don't include any spatial or temporal divisive normalization? That's correct. Okay. Straightforward. It was, it, it was an attempt to capture the basic simple complex response properties. Okay. And then this one might be a little more out there. It's from me. Uh, and I said, yeah. Give, yeah, given what we assume about how the visual system is wired, you know, retina, LGN, primary visual cortex, et cetera, uh, what, what does it mean that the standard model doesn't really seem to hold up in these more complex scenarios? And how then, just speculatively, should we be thinking about visual encoding? Yep, wow, that's, that's you gave me a fastball right, right, right across the plate. Um, <laughs> so I think there, there's the conservative way of, of looking at the results I was describing, uh, which is basically that, um, uh, and this is the way we started sort of thinking about it, is that, that mouse is sort of higher order uh, than we would have thought. Um, you know, if you if you think of uh, if you take this the standard, uh, I shouldn't say maybe I shouldn't say standard, but a common picture where people say, oh, V1 is the the simple and complex cells that form some sort of basis state, uh, like a wavelet decomposition uh, uh, of um, of the visual field, which is a, a fairly common thing to see in modeling, and then you build more complex features on top of that. If that picture is still true in mouse, then what we call V1 has to be further up the chain. Right, it can't be the place where you have the the dense um, wavelet basis. Uh, so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, I think perhaps a better way of thinking about it is that mice don't care about object recognition, <laughs> uh, which is maybe some maybe a place you would have started in the first place. Um, uh, but I but I a more uh, to, to to not be flippant about that. I think the idea is that uh, at least the idea I, I like to think about is that the the features that exist in these models. Um, are tied to the tasks that are, are the models are tuned to in some sense. So if you think about it, I'm training a network. I want the network to perform some task. I'm going to get some features that are appropriate for that task. Mice use their vision for different purposes. They have a different ethology. They have different behaviors. And so the visual system doesn't, doesn't correspond to the way we use our visual system. And therefore, the features would be different features. Do you, do you think ever that those features, though, might depend on the context of that task? or the, the, the brain state of the mouse because, because of sort of recurrence and feedback in the biological network? Oh, absolutely. So, so uh, I'm including context dependence in what I mean by a feature, right? So I just mean in feature, by feature, a general sense of what the network's responding to and why. Uh, and so context is a super important part of that, right? If, you're, if your visual system is to help you find food or run away from something that thinks you are food, the way you encode those stimuli is going to be very different than if your visual system's job is to compress an image, right? So, so a lot of things like sparse coding treat the visual system, or at least V1, as like a camera compression device uh, where you just get some set of basis functions. And then the idea is something later in the chain uses those basis functions for some computational purpose. Um, and if you don't need to do that basis function decomposition because you're doing something else, then you won't do it or if you don't have the hardware to do it, which is something I haven't mentioned, but it, and something we've looked at, which is if you, know, if you have to try to do object recognition, but you only have a mouse brain, um, what kind of features are you going to learn? And the answer is you're gonna learn sparse features because uh, you don't have a giant VGG size network to, to learn some dense basis decomposition. And then so, so one quick follow-up question, that is one other thing that kind of gets me about the, the standard model is that it's basically defined in averages, right? I mean, the whole idea and the, the set of questions that, that uh, Josh and Saskia had is you know, how many repetitions are you giving these things? And I don't have to see uh, a tennis ball a hundred times to have confidence that it's a tennis ball. And so 
I know one answer to this is that, well, you just need to have redundancy. You need to have a lot of cells. So you're averaging across the population. But do you think that our formulation of the standard model um, uh, sort of inappropriately assigns an explanation for that for that variability? I mean, could 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 the, the fact that sometimes cells respond, sometimes they don't, you need to take these long averages actually be a result of the fact that we're thinking about the system incorrectly? Oh, I'm, I'm to totally on board with that picture. Yes, that, okay. that the, the, the statement about what you know, the way the variables that we're interested in are coded in the brain are not necessarily mapped to a single cell is gonna fire because you showed this feature, right? If there's some complicated population projection uh, and the variability we see is just the fact that there's some, you know, something orthogonal to that that is projected into space in a way that we haven't thought about or can't control, uh, that's gonna produce that variability. That I'm, I'm totally on board with that picture. Okay, so, so we do need to go on, but we have two questions I think you can answer quickly that sort of popped up as a result of this. So the first is from Richard Bourne asking, as a point of comparison, it might be interesting to try to record some kind of neuropixel data set with an outbred mouse, uh, so wild, not wild type, from a species that's known to be more visual. Um, and then just I'll let you t tackle these quickly. And then the second one is, could we get a similar type of measurement in, say, the auditory system in the near future? So outbred oh. mouse and auditory system. Yeah, I would love to, to do something in the auditory system as well, but that, that's, a, that's a bigger question in terms of getting the, the so for example, if you're asking about the Institute doing that, that's a big question about getting the, the machinery tuned to do something like that. Uh, in principle, sure, uh, and I would love to see it. Um, now I'm not sure I understand the other question. Um, I, I think the question is- Oh, probably, yeah, 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 I, I, absolutely. I, I think that's, that's in the, I guess it's not a question, it's, it's a, sort of an agreement. I, I, I agree that, that um, something that has a different uh, ethology, right? And was, was raised in a different way, might show very different types of features. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Michael, thank, thank you uh, very, very much. I, yep. I enjoyed that. I hope everybody else listening enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, we're just moving on here. Next we have Xiaoxuan Jia. Um, and Xiaoxuan is a senior scientist in the MindScope program at the Allen Institute. And she will be presenting tracking information flow in mouse visual areas. Shashwan, are you ready to rock? Yes, I'm going to, uh, thank you. And I'm going to s switch topic from uh, talking about the representation to signal transmission in the visual system. And as Josh introduced, uh, well, the advantage of our data set is simultaneous recording of spiking activity from multiple areas simultaneously. With this, we can actually ask how does information flow in the mouse visual system during sensory, uh, during visual sensory stimulus. Uh, drive. Let me see. Yes. Um, so we know the visual areas are all, uh, has a modular structure, and with anatomical tracing experiment uh, in primates, they find there is a, these visual areas are organized hierarchically. And here is a diagram showing the uh, visual hierarchy in non-human primates. Each box represents a different area and the black lines indicate bidirectional connections between these areas. This visual hierarchy, anatomical hierarchy actually supported a functional hierarchy as well. With converging and diverging connections between processing stages, um, it's, it supports the integration of information which provided a enlarging of receptive field size and complexity along the hierarchy and supported tolerant representation at the top of the hierarchy. A recent uh, large scale anatomical tracing experiment in mouse also revealed a similar um, hierarchical organization um, to the primate. Uh, with the algorithm that maximized self-consistency, they assigned um, Lamina, different lamina patterns into either feed forward and feedback and calculated hierarchical score for each, uh, each visual area. And they find if arrange uh, the areas according to their anatomical hierarchic score, there is a, a hierarchical organization in the mouse visual areas. On the left, I'm showing um, two, subcort uh, two uh, subcortical visual areas involved in visual processing and six co uh, cortical areas involved in visual processing arranged according to their anatomical hierarchy score. As you can see, um, salamic nuclear algaean sits at the bottom of the hierarchy followed by primary visual cortex V1 and the cortical area AM and the PM are at the top of the hierarchy. However, 
this anatomically defined uh, hierarchy required to pass to pass some uh, functional test. With the multi-area uh, physiological recording in mouse, we can uh, assess whether um, the whether there is a functional hierarchy in mouse visual areas. So we find there is enlarging receptive field size along the anatomical hierarchy, increasing response latency, and the increasing receptive field complexity uh, along this anatomically defined hierarchy, suggesting, suggesting the existence of a functional hierarchy consistent with the anatomical one. So basically on the bottom in this scatter plot, the x-axis add an anatomically hierarchy score and the y-axis are the functional uh, metrics we measured with the electrophysiological recording. Next, we can ask, how is visual information propagated in the mouse visual areas? Because we know there is a lot of recurrent connections like the mouse um, visual cortical areas make all to all and the branching connections. So it is not obvious how, um, how spiking activity is propagated in this uh, system. So we wonder whether synaptic interactions follow this visual hierarchy during sensory stimulus. So we used a cross correlogram method to quantify the putative synaptic interactions in, uh, with spiking activity. The cross correlogram measure the relative spike timing between two spike trains. It can reflect correlation at a range of time scales. But because we are more interested in putative uh, synaptic interaction, which is um, in occur at a fast time scale, so we use a jitter correction method to remove stimulus locked component and also correlations longer than the jitter window, which we determine to be 25 milliseconds. On the right side is in an example uh, CCG uh, with sharp peak. This sharp peak indicate the target neuron has a much higher probability in generating action potential uh, with certain delay after each spike in the source neuron. Here, the peak offset is positive uh, with like what, three milliseconds that indicate the target neuron um, has a much higher probability in generating spiking, uh, generating spike three milliseconds after the source neuron. Because of uh, this peak offset can reflect the directionality, it can indicate that it, it, it can be used as an indication of uh, direction of signal flow. So we can estimate the distribution of peak offset um, of all uh, CCG uh, connections between two areas and ask what is the general information flow or information direction between two areas here I'm showing the distribution of CCG peak offset from V1 to LM. You can see the distribution has a positive shift and this suggests that the general direction is from V1 to LM. We can use a directionality score to calculate this asymmetry of this distribution, um, which is uh, quantified by calculating the difference of positive number of positive and the negative connections normalized by the total number of connections. And doing this, um, calculating this directionality score for all pairwise um, areas, we can create a directionality score map with the, um, with the areas, source and target areas around, arranged according to the anatomical hierarchy. You, can, you may already notice there is a gradual change uh, along the anatomical hierarchy to more directly compare to anatomical hierarchy. We can do a similar calculation with the anatomical hierarchy score by calculating the difference between pairs of areas and create a, a map of anatomical hierarchy score difference and directly correlate these two maps, the anatomical and the functional map, we found there is a significant correlation. This directly uh, supports that the functional signal flow follows the anatomically defined hierarchy during sensory drive. Uh, as I introduced in the beginning, in the map of the anatomical hierarchy, you may notice there are a lot of bidirectional connections, feed forward and feedback. So we think even though the visual hierarchy is uh, organized, uh, visual areas are organized hierarchy, uh, hierarchically, it's only a first order organization. Because there are a lot of recurrent connections mediated by the feed forward and feedback connections, the information actually forming a loop and 
how do we study uh, the information flow in this complex recurrent network? We are going to approach with from a network perspective. As I introduced, the CCG can reflect not only connection strengths, but also directionality. So we can actually calculate um, the difference of the CCG before and after zero time lag to create one single uh, number as, as a weight, directed weight between two neurons. And doing this for all pairs of uh, neurons of uh, that are simultaneously recorded, we can create an adjacency matrix where each uh, where the pixel or the entry of this adjacency matrix represent the connect uh, connection strengths and the directionality. Basically, when the uh, when the color is positive or the weight is positive, that means um, there's a, the the source uh, unit is leading the activity of the target unit. Here, the source and target units are organized are organized uh, about. Uh, with their uh, areas and according to their areas and also their uh, depths. And you can see there are some non-randomness in this adjacency matrix. And we used an uh, unsupervised uh, clustering method to identify uh, modules in this adjacency matrix that share a similar uh, connectivity pattern to the network. Basically, we reduce the dimensionality of the adjacency matrix and applied consensus clustering um, to the reduced, uh, uh, reduced uh, PCs and identi to identify the modules. We found three modules consistently across mice. The first module is dominated by weak connection to the network. The second cluster is dominated by a significant positive connection to the network. And the last uh, cluster is dominated by significant negative connections to the network. Because when the connection weight is positive, that means the source neuron is leading the activity or, or driving the activity of the, net, of the target neuron. And when it's negative, that means the source neuron is following uh, the activity of the, of the target neuron. So we st from now on, I'm going to call the uh, the cluster two dominated by positive connection as driver module and the cluster three as driven module. We can look at the network property of individual neurons in the driver and the driven module by first uh, uh, estimating the divergence degree of individual neurons. So the divergence degree is defined by the proportion of significant positive connections relative to the network size. And as you can see here, the driver modules has significantly higher a divergence degree compared to the driven module. And there is a trend of gradual decrease of the divergence degree. We can also estimate convergence degree. And, and what we found is the driven module actually have a higher convergence degree. Because from a network or graph perspective, node with a higher divergence degree are more likely to distribute information in the network and node with a higher convergence degree are more likely to converge or integrate information in the network we consider the driver neurons are more likely to be signal source in this uh, visual system and the driven neurons are more likely to be a signal sync in this visual system where we are measuring from we can also visualize um, the subnetworks cons uh, construct a uh, um, composed uh, subnetworks uh, sub uh, between driver and the driven neurons. Um, by plotting the adjacency matrix uh, in the graph, uh, in the graph uh, perspective, each node in the graph is a recording site. Um, it's it's uh, grouped according to uh, visual areas and arranged from superficial to deep clockwise. If we take a source, uh, take a source area V1, for example, connections from source to other areas will be plotted with red and connections back to the source area will be plotted with blue. Here I'm showing the subnetwork between driver neurons in the source area V1 to driven neurons in target areas. And here is the subnetwork between a driven neuron in source area V1 and the driver neuron in other higher visual areas. As you can see, 
the subnetworks um, composed by driver-driven neurons separated the input and output to the source area. Another thing you may notice is that this separation has a layer dependency. So we quantified the anatomical distribution of driver and driven neurons across layers and areas. We found driver neurons are more concentrated in the middle and superficial layers, while driven neurons are more concentrated in the deep layers. Uh, impressively, we found the proportion of driver neurons gradually decreased along the anatomical hierarchy. This is this anatomical distribution is consistent with a previous finding in primate, which showed the percentage of supergranular layer neurons that send feed forward projections gradually decrease along the hierarchy in primates. Combined with its network, uh, network role and the network properties, we think it's more likely the driver neurons to part, for, for the driver neurons to, to participate in the feed forward process while driven neurons to be more involved in recurrent process. This can be tested with their temporal dynamics. So if we compare the temporal dynamics of driver and the driven module as a whole, we find driver modules are responded, responded earlier and more transient, while driven modules are generally later and more sustained. If we break down into areas, we found there's a sequential activation of the uh, across the visual hierarchy within the driver module and which lead to the activity of driven module. And you don't see a clear trend across hierarchy within the driven module, which is more consistent with its uh, recurrent role. So to sum up, I think um, our study revised the functional topology and the information flow in mouse visual areas. We identified two uh, separate, two different modules which are distributed across mouse visual cortex. One is more uh, participating in distributing information. The other is integrating information. And we also found when visual, info, visual input first reach the driver module in V1, it will first propagate along uh, within the driver module along the visual hierarchy, which activates the driven module and then uh, get involved in the recurrent process. This is a hypothesis and require more testing. And we are testing, um, we are doing more experiment to test this uh, hypothesis. And I want to acknowledge everyone who contributed to this work. The first part related to a functional hierarchy uh, is published in uh, recently on Nature. And the later part is currently in a, a preprint format on, uh, on BioArchive. And if you're interested, you can uh, look into more details. And I want to acknowledge the NeuroPixels operation team who actually um, did the experiment and collected data and Christoph and Sean for supporting the project. And also everyone um, for this uh, team, the team science and open science at Allen Institute and Paul Allen for his vision and support to make this work possible. Xiao Xuan, thank you very, very much. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful paper and it's nice to hear you discuss those results. So um, we've got a, a couple specific questions from some of the panelists. So Joel was wondering about the plus minus 13 millisecond window uh, for de defining connectivity. And I uh, was curious about the robustness of, of your results to that, that window. Yeah, so the reason we use plus, sir, plus minus 30 millisecond is because we, I, for the jitter window, I use 25 millisecond. Um, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the reason. Um, you, actually, I tried, so there's a paper from Adam Cohn um, uh, testing different uh, jitter windows and they to, to obtain the sharp peak and remove all slow time correlation, a uh, jitter window smaller than 50 millisecond or 25 millisecond would be a, appropriate. That's the reason we chose 25 millisecond. Okay, and then as a as sort of a, a broad big picture question for folks who are not familiar with your paper, how much does the um, sort of computationally defined hierarchy challenge perhaps what we might have called the standard model of the visual hierarchy? Uh, can you repeat that? 
Yeah, so, so I think I think that a lot of people have sort of a, you know, I, I teach an intro neuro class here at WashU, and so I say, okay, we've got retina, LGN, V1, V2, retrospinal. So we sort of move through these, these systems as if it's a predetermined uh, 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 sort of transit route. Um, and, you know, I think that that's based on maybe some old school methods and old data sets. And so I'm curious how much uh, this, this very, very high resolution data driven remapping of that hierarchy might challenge some of the um, sort of more traditional mapping. Yeah, so that's actually the key point of the second part, second the paper, second paper, the modular paper. Basically, I think our findings suggest they are actually in uh, different from a traditional view, like uh, one step ahead, uh, like a point to point processing, or just a, a step by step, step step by step uh, recurrency. We actually find two modules, and these modules define two stages of processing, and these modules are multi area. So basically, within one module, you get a first pass of feed forward information across multiple areas. And then the first module or first processing stage will activate the second module, which is more involved in recurrence, and it is also multi-area. So I think this perspective is novel, um, and it, will, it is very different from a traditional view of a, of a hierarchical network. Cool. And then Sorry, and maybe you said this and I just missed it, but did you have did you take um, cell type into consideration in any of this? Uh, we so so we did like uh, classifying like uh, cell types based on waveforms, like uh, fast spiking and irregular spiking. Um, there is cell type specific uh, connectivity um, in, you can see from CCG, like uh, uh, there's a recurrency between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, but actually for our network analysis, currently it's not cell type specific. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd be very curious to see if, you know, perhaps like a broadly connected inhibitory neuron doesn't really fall into a clean driver or driven category and, and excitatory neurons are the ones that split so much or something. Um, oh, yeah. So in that sense, actually, I did the comparison and the proportion contributing to um, driver and the driven module uh, for the like a regular specking and fast backing is very similar. So I didn't see a very biased distribution in each module. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for a wonderful talk. And I recommend that people read that paper. Um, and so with that, I think we're right on time to move to uh, Peter Ladoshevich. Um, this is Peter's the, the, the last Allen and Sue scientist that we're going to hear from today. And he's a senior scientist in the MindScope program. And he'll be presenting a tale of two methods. Can we reconcile two photon calcium imaging with extracellular electrophysiology? And I know that the, the folks in my lab group would be very curious to hear your answer because um, we rant about this question quite a lot. So with that, Peter, take it away. Thank you, Keith, for the intro. <clears throat> in systems neuroscience today, large field of view calcium imaging and extracellular electrophysiology are the dominant methods for the coding activity of neuronal populations with single cell resolution. We strive to learn universal facts about the brain, right, and view our methods as just a means to an end. So we typically pick the recording modality that is experimentally best suited to ask a particular scientific question. But if we were to try and, and ask exactly the same question using two different methods, would we get the same answer? We sure hope we would, but if we always did, this would be a much shorter talk. The two large scale data sets my colleague Saskia and Josh introduced, each collected with a different recording modality, put us in a unique position to pull on that particular thread. The experiments were standardized as much as that was under our control. All animals went through a similar pre-processing uh, pipeline, pre-imaging. The geometries of the recording rigs were similar, and the same visual stimuli were presented. To highlight the major remaining differences, though, the NeuroPixels probes recorded data along a column normal to the cortical surface, while 2P collected data in a plane parallel to cortex at some given depth. Uh, at a glance, we can see that population activity appears to be much more sparse when viewed through the lens of 2P imaging and electrophysiology samples much faster in the time domain. But the differences do not end there. For any neuron, the data we analyze contain a mixture of the neuron's actual activity and noise. 
In extracellular electrophysiology, the raw signal is a voltage trace. It's shape driven uh, by action potentials. In calcium imaging, the raw signal is a fluorescence time series that reflects changes in intracellular calcium concentration. Many such changes are associated with action potentials, but not all of them necessarily have to be. The structure of the data we feed into downstream analyses is different as well. EFIS yields binary spike trains with sub-millisecond precision. From fluorescence, on the other hand, we eventually extract calcium events, which have magnitudes reflecting the amplitudes of the peaks in the DF over F and can have a complicated relationship with the underlying instantaneous firing rate. The most diverse differentiating factor, though, are the sources of noise. In EFIS, the predominant processing steps injecting noise are spike detection and spike clustering, which favor units with large amplitude waveforms at high firing rates. In OFIS, there's a plethora of other noise contributions, um, such as photon detection, uh, noise contributors, such as photon detection of target fluorescence, animal motion, neuropil, and image processing issues, can all result in apparent deflections in the fluorescence trace, which may be picked up as false, positive by an, uh, false positives by an overzealous event detection algorithm. So let's consider a putative example neuron responding with four spikes each to the presentation of a drifting grating for two different stimulus conditions. For the first condition, the response is a burst of four spikes. Of four spikes. For the second, the spikes are more spread out. The response magnitudes for EFIS for each condition is four. It just so happens here in this example that one spike gets lost and one gets misattributed. But into P, the burst causes a disproportionately large amplitude event, while the isolated spikes lead to event amplitudes easily lost in the noise. And so what gets detected adds up to a much smaller integrated event magnitude for the trial. These spike counts, event magnitudes integrated over uh, trial duration form the basis for computing functional metrics for each neuron. We consider a neuron responsive to a class of stimuli, such as drifting or static gratings, when for any combination of stimulus parameters, the elicited responses are larger than the 95th percentile of spontaneous activity on at least 25% of the trials. We can measure the responsiveness of the population as a fraction of neurons that are responsive. For the sparse of neurons, we can further find the preferred stimulus parameter value that elicits the largest response, as well as calculate how reliably that response exceeds spontaneous activity trial to trial. We can also calculate selectivity metrics like lifetime sparseness or global orientation selectivity index, which capture how pronounced the tuning is. Comparing these two example neurons recorded from the same area and matched by preference, note just how much sparser the calcium response rasters look compared to the EFIS responses. As one might expect, the specification is sensitive to the event detection step, which we will get back to. Now, the good news is that looking across all visual areas and stimulus classes, the distribution of preferences across neurons appears to be independent of the recording modality. However, we systematically observe a larger fraction of responsive neurons with electrophysiology, while calcium imaging appears to imply much higher levels of stimulus selectivity. So there are our discrepancies we need to explain. To compare the similarity of two distributions using a single number, we use the Jensen-Shannon distance, which is zero for identical distributions and one for um, non-overlapping uh, distributions. To better quantify the relationship between electrophysiological spikes and fluorescence events, we have collected simultaneous to photon and cell attached electrophysiology recordings from 48 cells across four GCAM transgenic mouse lines. The mice were likely anesthetized and visual stimuli were presented to drive activity. Such experiments are very low throughput and not feasible to perform across tens of thousands of neurons in awake running animals and for hours at a time. While we collected the 2P data at the highest available spatial temporal resolution, we have carefully downsampled it to match the sampling rate and noise levels of realistic population level recordings where there are uh, comparatively much fewer pixels per soma and the average action potential associated calcium spike is smaller and more variable. Our paper describing this work uh, just appeared in eLife yesterday, uh, and the uh, simultaneous recorded calibration data set is also publicly available via the link below. I believe there was a question in the chat about that earlier. So for this calibration data set, 
where we know the ground truth action potential times, how well can we infer spikes from the fluorescence data? Not all that well, I'm afraid. Let's look at single uh, spike detection probabilities with the false positive rate fixed at 1%. If we calibrate a spike detector, if we calibrated a spike detector for each cell using its respective ground truth, the probability of single spike detection would only be around 20 to 50%, depending on genotype, at realistic image, imaging conditions at least. But even those modest numbers are hard to achieve in practice where ground truth for every neuron is not available. Using three different recent spike inference models with model parameters trained separately for each gen genotype, we arrived at significantly smaller single spike detection probabilities. We saw very similar performance between all three algorithms when quantified by Pearson's correlation uh, between event magnitudes and bin ground truth firing rates. But that does not mean that the three algorithms produce identical outputs. In fact, uh, non-negative deconvolution, for instance, is more permissive of small magnitude false positive events than say the exact L0 algorithm uh, with our default regularization constraints. Reducing such false positives by imposing a threshold on the minimum event magnitude as a function of estimated noise in the recording predictably lowers the false positive rate as well as the integrated event magnitude. However, on average, the correlation with ground truth is barely affected. Well, why is this important? It turns out that our selectivity metrics uh, can be quite sensitive to the false uh, positive rate. Comparing exact L0 and non-negative deconvolution on the same example neuron, we find the same preference, but because of the much higher background event rate, a greatly reduced selectivity. However, simply by applying an appropriate threshold on the NND event magnitudes, we can recover the exact same selectivity results as we got from L0. Uh, so in tuning the event magnitude thrust, is tuning the event magnitude threshold the solution to matching selectivity distributions across modalities? After all, at zero threshold, we get much fewer selective cells than even in EFIS. And at a threshold between three and four times the noise level, uh, we get a pretty good match to the EFIS selectivity distribution. Not so fast. The thresholding levels affect the responsiveness distributions as well. However, for drifting gradings and natural scenes to match EFIS responsiveness, we would need to set the threshold around two times the noise standard deviation, while for static gradings, even setting it to zero does not fully close the gap between the two recording modalities. So there appears to be no single consistent event magnitude threshold that minimizes discrepancies across metrics and stimulus classes. While tweaking the event detection may help, it cannot be the complete story. So we attempted an alternative approach. The biophysically inspired model ML spike allows not only spike inference, but also the fitting of a forward model to ground truth data, which can then be used to translate real recorded spike trains into synthetic calcium data. This way, we can treat the neural pixels recordings as a kind of pseudo ground truth and analyze the simulated fluorescence traces obtained using the forward model exactly the same way as we would have analyzed 2P imaging data. As you can see in this example, the effect of the forward model leads as expected to a sparsification of responses and a nonlinear emphasis of bursting activity. Going back to comparing distributions across entire populations of neurons, the forward model passes the first sanity check in that as expected, it does not affect preference distributions at the same time it does significantly increase selectivity and moves the selectivity distributions towards those obtained from actual to photon imaging experiments, albeit not quite all the way. However, the forward model alone fails to reconcile differences in responsiveness, which is again the odd one out. Only a small fraction of cells switch from responsive to non-responsive or vice versa after application of the forward model. And in fact, the numbers are balanced in both directions, so the forward model alone barely changes the fraction of responsive cells. We hypothesized that maybe the discrepancy in the responsiveness distributions has more to do with our potentially ethos specific biases rather than with the propensity of calcium imaging to miss isolated spiking events and overemphasize bursting. We filtered the cells included in the analysis to control for a number of potential other discrepancies between the 2P and the NeuroPixels data sets, such as skewed distribution of uh, recorded units across layers and bias and running behavior. Running behavior matching 
had almost no effect on the responsiveness discrepancy and matching across layers had only a small effect. As discussed earlier, we expect ethers to be biased towards higher firing rates, as well as to be potentially contaminated due to misclustering of spikes. It turns out that filtering for neurons that the two photon data set has <coughs> that in the two-photon data set have the highest event rates, does the most to improve the responsiveness distribution match across modalities, followed closely by subselection of EFAS units for minimal spike clustering contamination as quantified by interspike interval violations. This suggests that differences in responsiveness more likely reflect neuronal sampling bias or cluster merging artifacts during spike sorting rather than flaws in the event detection from fluorescence time series. Overall, and across multiple stimulus classes, the combination of forward model, selection for highly active neurons in 2P and less contaminated neurons in ethers results in the closest distributional matches across modalities. The Jensen-Shannon distances are still not zero though, so the matches are close, but not perfect. We do not have a complete explanation of the residual discrepancies, but a partial explanation might be that the real two photon calcium uh, data may contain signal not fully captured by the forward model. Here is a fun, here is a fun thing we observed in a few of our ground truth recording. Look at these sets of three spike bursts, all from the same neuron recorded over the span of three minutes. Naively, we would expect them all to associate with similar size fluorescence events. However, when we look one layer deeper at the cell attached voltage traces, we find that some of these bursts are right on top of plateaus of various duration. And the ones that do result in much larger, much more variable fluorescence events. The plot thickens further once we realize that the longest plateaus correspond to the largest transients uh, and the shortest plateaus correspond to the smallest transients. In fact, when we regress event magnitude against plateau duration, we find that for recordings where such plateaus occur, we can predict event magnitudes much better from the plateau duration than from the number of spikes involved in the burst. In our calibration data set, these plateaus are more, most prevalent and pronounced in EMX1 lines, which are known for a tendency towards frequent interactal events. So we do not have a good sense how commonly plateaus, plateau associated fluorescence transients are misconstrued as large bursts in more popular lines. In any case, the tools currently out there do not generally model such non-stationarities in the spike to calcium transfer function. They do not model calcium sources other than action potentials. And even if they did, extracellular electrophysiology does not capture plateau potentials. And even cell attached recordings capture them only occasionally when the seal resistance is in the hundreds of mega ohms. I am solidly out of time, I think, uh, but I would like to shout out special thanks to my amazing colleagues who have done much of the work I had the privilege of presenting today. Josh Siegel, Saskia DeVries, Lawrence Wang, Jack Waters, and Michael Bies. I would like to thank Paul Allen for enabling all of this work. And finally, uh, last but not least, the rest of my colleagues at the Allen Institute and all of you who are listening for your attention. I am happy to take any questions. Peter, thank, thank you. Um, I thought that was thorough, meticulous, and, and spectacular sort of approach to what has ultimately been a very, very challenging question for those of us interested in this side of neuroscience. So um, if, if questions come in, I'll read them to you, but I have some questions of my own if you're willing to entertain them. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I guess one thing I always have trouble wrapping my head around is that the sort of evolutionarily stable aspect of the time course of a spike, right? So a spike takes about, let's ignore sort of interesting cochlear neurons. And so your general cortical neuron, you know, 1.1, 1.3, 1.4 milliseconds, something like that. And your calcium transients are much, much, much longer than that. So even if you were able to close that JS gap in, in these data sets, I feel like there must be something we're losing due to the, just the, the, the order of magnitude difference in the resolvable time scale. And I'd like to just know your thoughts on that because I, I reflect bias, I do electrophysiology. I might just be trying to convince myself that I made the right choice when I built my lab, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> well, I think what we're learning more and more, um, right, is that um, really one cannot blanket state that one method is superior to the other. Right, electrophysiology 
uh, I think in most people's minds still holds a um, more fundamental ontological status, right? Just because it's been around much longer and also because we believe that, you know, the fundamental units of information transfer are spikes and it's, it's this electrical activity, right? Um, so definitely when you're asking questions about timing, uh, questions about synchronization, um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, hands down, electrophysiology uh, can, can teach us things that calcium imaging potentially cannot. Right. However, what's interesting is that calcium imaging may not just be a, a more impoverished, uh, you know, version of, of what we get in electrophysiology. Instead, the signals might actually carry additional information. Right. So potentially there, there is an internal amplifier. Right. That boosts certain uh, types of electrophysiological events that have. Uh, more downstream impact, right? More important meaning. And those get highlighted to us by, by calcium imaging, right? But, but there's no question that we lose something in the temporal domain. So, so but, that, but you bring up a really interesting point, um, which is that calcium does, calcium traces are not spikes. Exactly. Right? Spikes are associated with calcium, but calcium is doing a lot of other things in the cell. And so, you know, usually I would tend to sort of disregard that as this is noise, this makes it hard to deconvolve spikes. But you bring up the point that, that, that you have a richer data set in that sense. I mean, so that the, these plateau associated fluorescences that you, that you point to. Um, so I guess that just raises the question, to what extent is it appropriate to interpret calcium as if it is a, 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 a Xerox of spiking activity? Basically to the extent to which our models in which that assumption is baked in can actually predict what calcium data would look like based on the spike train. Okay. And that extent is not 100%. That extent is more like 30%. Right? Right. That's, a big, that's a big gap. It is. It, it can be a substantial gap. And depending on what sort of question you ask in what sort of cell type, uh, right, it is imperative to do some sort of basic calibration to to have an idea of how often you may be misled by your calcium data, right? I mean, the holy grail, of course, would be to, to stare at the calcium data and say, okay, well, this spike looks slightly different. And I attribute that not to a bunch of action potentials, but I attribute that to some plateau event. And this other event, well, that's just a bunch of action potentials. And as of today, we do not know how to do that, right? So that, that is a, a question for the future, how to differentiate that information out of the calcium data. Okay, so I know, I know Joel wants to ask a question live. So Joel, you gonna? Yeah, so my question is similar in some ways to Keith's, which is this question, you know, I know philosophically, um, a lot of neuroscientists look at calcium imaging as like a proxy for recording spiking activity. And, and that's what they're trying to do because we've always been obsessed with spikes. Um, but as he said, the calcium signals themselves are intrinsically interesting, especially from the perspective of synaptic plasticity. And so I wonder if instead of trying to shoehorn calcium data into this box that it doesn't really fit into as like a spiking proxy, we should just be, be studying it on, in its own regard. Um, that's one part of my question. And the second question is if we really wanted to do what you proposed, Peter, which is to have for every cell, uh, both of these things, could we not in principle co-express GCAMP and a voltage indicator, uh, say with two different colors, and then with, with simultaneous two color imaging, get both uh, for all the cells uh, at the same time? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that is a fantastic question, Joel. Uh, I mean, the first part I think was, was more of a comment and I completely agree with that, with, with that comment, right? And uh, yeah, I, I think there are, there are features in calcium imaging that, that are worth studying uh, in their own right uh, in, in calcium data. Um, as, as far as the suggestion of um, uh, you know, two color imaging, I think in some sense that is a, a dream experiment, but in, in a different sense, we also have to be cautious. And we have to be cautious because voltage imaging has its own intrinsic biases, which we do not fully understand yet, right? The levels of noise are much higher. We do not quite have 
uh, the macroscopy that allows us to collect uh, enough photons at the frame rate that we would need to you know cover the the kinetics of uh, those voltage indicators and there are also biological problems because you know, i didn't mention that but we actually went to great lengths to do a bunch of electrophysiology in transgenic mice just to check whether the fact that it is a transgenic mouse uh, changes, you know, some of our results, uh, right? And uh, we actually, you know, haven't found huge differences, but we found some, like in some lines, for instance, bursting is, is more frequent. So what I'm saying is that expressing two transgenes at really high levels can potentially cause problems in, uh, in metabolic level of the cell. Uh, and, you know, we will observe, you know, potentially uh, artifacts uh, due to that too. But in some sense, for voltage imaging, when it you know, finally becomes prime time at a single le cell level, I would want to see a similar type of detailed calibration analysis to understand its own intrinsic biases. P uh, Peter, I think, I think uh, Caitlin wants us to go to a five minute break. Um, I'm getting the nod for that. So this is a fantastic discussion. It can be continued in the, in the Q&A typed. Um, and we're going to break for five minutes. And then we'll be back with Yaniv Ziv, um, another fantastic scientist outside the Allen. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you. Yes, we are going to go to a break for about five minutes here. Uh, go get yourself some more coffee or a snack. We will return at 10 to the hour, which is 9.50 here in Seattle. Uh, 10 to the hour at wherever you are as well. And we have three outstanding speakers from outside of the Allen Institute who are using the Allen Brain Observatory in their work. So again, we are gonna return at 10 to the hour. If you have questions for Peter or any of the speakers who spoke uh, already today, you can go ahead and pop those in the Q&A and they will respond to them. Please also remember that we are going to have a tutorial on the Allen Brain Observatory starting at 11 o'clock Pacific. That's an hour and 15 minutes from now. Uh, this will be in a separate Zoom space. So you can find the link to that in the page where you uh, found the login information to join us here in this Zoom space or YouTube, um, or we'll drop the link in the chat so you can join us in that other Zoom room at 11 o'clock Pacific which is in an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, that's gonna be a tutorial for those of you who have not used the Allen Brain Observatory before or have only used it a little bit and would like to dive in more, learn how to use it more for your own work. We hope you're feeling really inspired to get started using this resource. Again, we'll be returning in about three minutes at the top of the hour. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
We are gonna get started again in just a moment here. Again, we have three more speakers after the break. And please uh, do join us at 11 o'clock Pacific time for a tutorial to learn how to use the Allen Brain Observatory yourself. All right, Keith, take it away. All right, thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, so we are back. Hopefully your break was refreshing. Um, our next talk is from um, Yaniv Ziv, who's at the Wiseman Institute in Israel. Um, and he is an assistant, assistant professor uh, at the Department of Neurobiology. And he'll be presenting representational drift in the mouse, vis mouse visual cortex. So anybody who's been paying attention to the Q&A will know that I'm very interested in this idea of representational drift. So Yaniv, please enlighten us. Thank you very much, Keith, uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, exciting uh, symposium. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I will uh, present today uh, some uh, recent results from our lab that using the data from the Allen Brain Observatory uh, suggest the existence of representational drift in the mouse visual cortex. Uh, and this is the work of, uh, uh, of uh, Daniel Ditch, a very talented graduate student in the lab in close collaboration with Dr. Alon Rubin, a staff scientist in, in the lab. Now, uh, in my lab, we are interested in neural coding of long-term memory, and specifically, we try to understand how memory information is encoded in the brain and what happens to it over time scales that range from days to months, time scales that are relevant for long-term memory. And we focus our, our work on the hippocampus and related cortical structures that are important for memory of places and events. Uh, and we heavily rely on optical imaging in our, uh, in our uh, you know, work, and specifically on calcium imaging uh, using miniature fluorescence microscopes, which allows us to, uh, uh, to image in freely behaving mice the same uh, population, large population of neurons over extended periods of time, extending many days, weeks, and even months. And in an in a experiment we did using this technique, we found a, a rather surprising uh, result. We found that uh, hippocampal representations of a fixed familiar environment gradually changed with time. So I'd like to describe this very simple experiment to you now. What we did was to train mice to run back and forth along a simple linear track. It was a familiar linear environment. And we image the hippocampal CA1 of these mice uh, every uh, several days uh, over a month. Uh, and uh, and uh, in the hippocampus, there are places that form a, a hippocampal representation of that environment. Uh, and we analyze uh, the stability of these maps. So if you look on the map that was formed here on the left, uh, and that was formed by the places that were active on day five, the, the first day of this experiment, you can see each line is the, is the um, uh, response of one cell along the linear track. So the x-axis here is the linear track, is the length of the linear track. And you can see that a, a very nice map here and that many of the cells that were active on day five or place coding on day five were no longer uh, place coding on later days. And you can see this gradual fading of this specific representation. But this is not something that is unique for the first day of this experiment. If you take as a reference uh, uh, the map that was formed by all the places that were place coding on day 20, the middle of the experiment, you can see the gradual buildup and gradual decay of this representation. And likewise, if you focus your attention uh, or take as a reference the last day of learning, the last day of this task, day 35, you can see that many of the cells that formed this map were actually not place coding uh, in the beginning. And again, this is a fixed, familiar environment. There's no learning here. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, uh, now, now this uh, uh, finding of representational drift was rather, rather surprising at the time because, uh, because of, the, of the notion that uh, uh, you need a, a stable uh, hippocampal representation to support a stable uh, memory of spatial, stable spatial memory. Now, uh, I'd like to, to emphasize that um, uh, this representational drift is different than mere variability in the neuronal activity. Uh, <clears throat> Now, as, as was mentioned in, in the earlier talks, we have variability in the, in the neuronal activity, but when we look on a, a, a variability, uh, the, the changes that the similarity between the representation of any two, uh, any two uh, presentation of the stimulus or episodes uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, decay as a function of uh, elapsed time, whereas in representational drift, it is. So this is just to, to, uh, to clarify this. Now, since this discovery, uh, 
uh, several other labs have found similar results in other subfields of the hippocampus and out, also outside of the hippocampus using uh, uh, similar and other uh, uh, recording techniques. But then the question has remained whether representational drift is something that is unique to the hippocampus or to associative a, a cortical area, or is it something uh, more general uh, or more of a general phenomenon in the brain and uh, which also exists in uh, sensory cortical areas? So this was the question we wanted to address using the Allen Brain Observatory data. And we didn't, we not only wanted to understand whether representational drift occur in sensory cortical areas, but also what are the cellular properties that could underlie such representational drift should it exist? And to what extent does new, the neural code stability follow the hierarchy of sensory processing. So to address this question, we took advantage of the, uh, the Allen Brain Observatory data sets. We used the two data sets that we heard about uh, earlier, the two photon calcium imaging data sets from hundreds of mice across six uh, different visual cortical area, and the neuropixel electrophysiological data sets from tens of mice uh, recorded in six visual uh, uh, cortical area and two thalamic areas. And what we did was to analyze data, uh, again, from head-fixed mice uh, that were running on, on a wheel while they were passively viewing a natural scene movie. And the reason we, we choose a, a natural scene movie uh, for, for our work was because this was the stimulus that was presented either uh, uh, twice, uh, to, uh, two blocks within the same session or at, uh, at uh, one block of, of, of several presentations every day uh, in a three-day uh, uh, imaging course. So, so we use calcium imaging data and neuropixels data. Uh, uh, I will not go into the details, uh, but uh, I'll just mention, uh, kind of relating to Peter's talk uh, earlier, that uh, uh, often uh, when, um, when one study uh, coding stability, uh, there are confounding issues that relate to the specific uh, method that is used for recording. Now, having here data uh, from, uh, from recordings, uh, from two different recording techniques doing the exact same experiment allows us to over, overcome and avoid some of the specific biases and, and, and limitations that are associated with each of these techniques. So this is one, uh, one of the strengths in, in, uh, in this approach. Now, to... Uh, to so, so in our data, we could, uh, uh, in our analysis, we could readily identify uh, uh, neurons that respond to specific moments uh, within these natural scene movies. For instance, here I'm showing you three cells that responded uh, uh, to, to specific moments in the movie and displayed a very stable and nice tuning to specific moments uh, that was stable across three different sessions spanning uh, different days. Uh, whereas here I'm showing you three, uh, three different units from the neuropixels data, again, showing very nice uh, tuning to specific moments in the movie and stable tuning across different blocks of movie presentations that were separated 20 minutes apart. Now to analyze uh, uh, the stability of the code uh, on a, a seconds to minute scale, we use the, uh, the, the neuropixels data sets. Uh, uh, so here I'm showing you uh, 10 movie repeats and each movie repeat we divide it to equal time bins uh, and for each for each bin we constructed a, a vector that constitutes the activity of the entire recorded population. We call this the population vector and what you see in this metric is the population vector correlation across different time bins and different movie presentations. And what is uh, very clear here is these main diagonals that shows that the uh, specific moments in the movie uh, are represented in a, in a reliable manner. Uh, and you can see it in uh, even nicer when you average across all pairs of movie repeats. Uh, and this is example from a single mouse in, in uh, V1. Now, if we uh, then, uh, if we then uh, average uh, the, uh, the population vector correlation values across the same time bins, we can capture the, st the, the stability of the ensemble representation between different movie repeats and then calculating the mean population vector correlation as a function of the interval between movie repeats shows a significant gradual uh, decline, which indicate representational drift. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here in this example mouse from uh, V1, we can actually see when we uh, average across all mice uh, and all uh, cortical, uh, visual cortical areas, we see a significant uh, time-dependent decline in the population vector correlation in the similarity between 
uh, the representation of different uh, movie uh, uh, repeats. Uh, now we ask what uh, what several properties could underlie this observed representational drift. Uh, so we consider two. Uh, one is changes in the activity rates, uh, irrespective of changes in the tuning of the cells, and the other is changes in the tuning, uh, which means to which moment in the movie a cell is responding to, uh, irrespective of changes in the activity rates. And we found that both uh, both of them occur in in the data. Uh, so here I'm showing you the, the ensemble rate correlation or the correlation between the activity rates of neurons uh, as a function of the interval between movie repeats. And we see a significant uh, decline in, in this correlation uh, uh, for all cortical uh, areas. And we see a more modest decline and yet significant in all cortical areas also for the tuning curve correlation or the correlation between the tuning curve of individual neurons active uh, on different uh, movie repeats. Now, uh, we see a similar thing when we now analyze uh, uh, the stability across different blocks that are set blocks of movie presentations that are separated 20 minutes apart. We, uh, we use the, uh, 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 the similarity between the first half and the second half of movie presentations within a block to obtain the within block stability uh, and then compare across blocks and we see this time dependent decay uh, in, the, in the similarity across all six visual areas. And here as well, this was uh, 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 driven by changes in both activity rates and uh, tuning. And what I'm showing you here for timescales of tens of minutes, we see also now switching to the calcium imaging data over timescales of days. So this is, a, again, a, I'm showing you here the population vector correlation matrix for, a, a, for one example, mouse in V1. Uh, that was presented with the same movie all, on, on three different sessions uh, uh, that occur on different days. If, and if you uh, look on this main diagonal here, you can see it's fading uh, 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 gradually with time. And this is something that we again see in all cortical visual areas, this uh, a gradual change over days, suggesting representational drift occurs over time scales that's spanning minutes to days. Now, uh, what we wanted to ask next is to what extent the, uh, does the neural code stability follow the hierarchy of visual processing in the mouse? So as we uh, heard uh, earlier uh, uh, from Josh and others, uh, recent studies by the Allen Institute established the hierarchical organization in the visual cortex uh, in which uh, LGM is at the bottom uh, and area AM is at the top. And one could naively hypothesize that uh, lower brain areas, those, those that are more, uh, that are closer to the primary sensory uh, uh, synapses or to, to the sensory organ itself would display higher uh, stability than more than higher or more associative areas. And this is something we wanted to address using the data. So to ask to, to address this question, we analyze <coughs> uh, and we compare between uh, 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 the drift occurring in V1 and its downstream uh, LM. Uh, both of them are situated anatomically close to each other and present a, a similar reliability of tuning. And what we found in all uh, examined timescales, uh, minutes, uh, minutes to hours, and minutes to days, uh, and this is, cal uh, this is uh, Neuropixis data, and this is calcium imaging data, was that uh, V1 actually uh, displayed faster drift than its downstream area uh, LM. Uh, likewise, uh, using the neuropixels data, we could compare between two thalamic areas, the LGN and its downstream area LP. And here again, we found something that is opposite to, uh, to the naive hypothesis. We found that uh, uh, LGN drifted faster than uh, area LP. So, uh, so the data doesn't seem to support this naive hypothesis that, uh, uh, that stability would reflect the hierarchy of information flow across areas. If anything, uh, maybe the opposite. Now, uh, given what I showed you so far, we now ask how could the visual system generate consistent perception despite uh, this drift in neuronal responses at the individual cell level? And uh, uh, in a recent study from our lab, Alon Rubin analyzed uh, calcium imaging data from the C1, uh, hippocampal C1 of mice that ran back and forth along a linear track, just like I showed you in the beginning. And what Alon did was to uh, apply a nonlinear dimensionality reduction on the data, which exposed this uh, peculiar symmetrical structure in the reduced space of neuronal activity. 
So here each data point uh, 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 represents the activity of the entire recorded population within a single frame of 50 milliseconds. Uh, so you can think of this uh, uh, structure uh, as representing the, uh, the structure of relationship between, your, uh, between population activity patterns. Now, uh, using the exact same experiment, only now recording from another brain area from the anterior cingulate cortex, and applying the same analysis exposed a completely different internal structure of neuronal activity, which was also associated with a, a different behaviors. Now, very relevant for our work, we found, uh, and I, uh, here showing you data from the hippocampus, that despite ongoing changes in the activity of individual neurons, as I showed you in the beginning, the internal structure of neuronal population activity was conserved over time. So we wanted to apply a similar analysis to the data from the Allen Brain Observatory. So here again, we uh, used a, a nonlinear dimensionality reduction uh, applied on, uh, uh, on, on the data uh, from, the, uh, from the Allen Brain Observatory, uh, uh, specifically for, for vectors that constitute the activity of the entire population at the uh, individual time beams. And this exposed the, <coughs> sorry, a low dimensional uh, structure in the high dimensional population activity. And this is an example from V1 uh, and, the, and the color code uh, represents the time in the movie. You can see that the uh, 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 nearby times are, are actually nearby in the, in, the, in the reduced dimensional space. And what we found was that uh, each visual area had a, a distinct uh, internal structure of neural activity, which was stereotypic uh, for the same brain area across different mice. And what I'm showing you here for the reduced, uh, in reduced dimensional space, we can see uh, uh, in, in a somewhat equivalent way, when we look on the, uh, uh, on the similarity matrices uh, 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 of time by time. So this is similar to the representation similarity analysis that uh, was uh, shown earlier. Here, uh, 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 this is a, a matrix showing the correlation between the population activity at each time point uh, along the movie. And again, you can see that uh, we see a, a different uh, structure uh, uh, across the uh, visual cortical areas, but similar across uh, different mice. And very consistent with what we find in hippocampus, despite ongoing changes in the coding properties of individual neurons, which are indicated here in grayscale. This is the change in population vector correlation as a function of elapsed time. In the calcium imaging data, the internal structure of population activity was conserved uh, over time, as indicated here in the colored line uh, for each of the six visual cortical area. And we, uh, 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 we suggest that uh, this uh, stability of the internal structure of neuronal activity might uh, underlie stable perception despite gradually uh, uh, changing uh, coding properties of individual neurons. So with this, I'll, uh, I'll end and summarize. I've shown you uh, that representational drift occurs uh, in, the visual, uh, uh, in the visual cortex, in the visual system across all uh, uh, cortical areas as well as subcortical areas that we studied. Uh, and they uh, occur on uh, time scales of minutes to days. We found changes in both uh, uh, activity rates and tuning, but changes in individual cells activity rates were actually more pronounced than changes in the cells tuning. Neural code stability uh, doesn't seem to reflect the visual processing hierarchy. And, and finally, I've shown you that the structure of relationship between neuronal population activity patterns is stereotypic and stable over time. And with this, I'll uh, just uh, end and thank again the people who did the work uh, specifically uh, Daniel Ditch and, and Elon Rubin. And this is again an, a, an excellent opportunity to say a huge thank you for the uh, Allen Institute team and, the, and the, all the people who were involved in the Allen Brain Observatory and, and, and giving the community this uh, very valuable uh, resource, uh, a, a gift really uh, uh, for us to do science with. Uh, and thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. That, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I have, I, have, I have a lot of questions and I know um, there's a couple other questions coming from the, the other panelists here. But so let me just quickly start and ask um, a simple question. What, what was the, I mean, I know I can go pull the paper, but what was the dimensionality reduction method that you used to find that some most stable structure that also replicated across animals? I'm, I'm going to immediately dive into this. So, so uh, for, for, this is just for for um, for visualization processes uh, uh, purposes. We use the uh, TSNE. Okay. Uh, 
but uh, the quantification uh, that I showed you was done on the on the on the similarity matrices, showing you the the time by time matrices. Cool. And then, so so one one question that I sort of have is is um, what do you think matters more for for the drift that you observe at the population coding level? Is it is it the interval of time or is it the number of repetitions, the familiarity? So another way to phrase that would be, does having seen something a lot of times change the underlying contribution of neurons to the encoding of that thing? This is an excellent question, very important question. Uh, so, so basically, again, uh, is it the, uh, the total amount of time, the absolute amount of time elapsed time or the amount of experience uh, uh, that the, the, the mouse uh, um, undergoes through? Uh, we addressed this question in the hippocampus. Uh, so I can, I can answer about how it affects drift in the hippocampus. And in the hippocampus, we see that time and experience uh, differentially affect two distinct aspects of the representation. Time mostly affects changes in activity rates, whereas experience, the amount of experience, mostly drive changes in the cell's tuning to position, but still. Okay, great. Um, th thank you. So. Uh, uh... Joel, Joel, you want to read your question? Uh, yeah, so I like this this comparison of sort of the stability of individual neuron responses to like population representation structures. And I wonder if the higher stability of the population representation structure uh, is something specific about the representations in, in cortex or might be a product just of the fact that you took a low dimensional description of the higher dimensional data and so, for example, if you had just taken a, a couple low dimensional like random projections, so project down on three random axes, that would give you a three dimensional description of the data. Uh, would you see the same thing or do you think that uh, you would not in that in that other case? I, I actually think it's not a, a, a measure of the specific, uh, you know, dimensions or, or, or the, the specific embedding uh, that, that, that you choose. Uh, uh, for the data, because you can you can you can quantify this in, in a number of ways, and, and what what I have shown is actually a, a quantification that was based on the similarity matrices, so not dimensionally reduced data. Um, it, it it is it is something that is affected by the number of neurons you include in the analysis. Uh, if if this is the I see, I missed that point that, that the population level result was not due to the low dimensional uh, description. So that, that answers my question, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna read you one more question and we should actually move on to, to Joel's talk in a sec. But so the, the last question here um, is first amazing work. And then what was the metric to quantify neural activity? Is it the peak divided by the average? To, to quantify neuronal activity? So we, okay, so for the, for the NeuroPixels data set, this is simply spikes, and we use the sorting uh, that was available from the data set from the uh, uh, Allen Brain Observatory data sets, as is. Um, uh, we did some sanity checks uh, on ourselves, but this is just spiking data itself. Uh, for the calcium imaging data, uh, uh, we, did a, we did the analysis in a number of ways, but the, the one I showed you and the one that is in the paper is by just applying a, a, a threshold of four absolute uh, uh, deviations uh, on the, uh, so a very stringent, very conservative threshold on the activity, uh, uh, you know, just to be very conservative. You need, thank you very, very much. That was enjoyable. Great talk. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, need to keep moving now. Uh, so ne next up is my, my friend, Joel Zilberberg. And uh, before Joel starts, I'd like to remind everybody that at the conclusion of all of these talks, uh, we will have a, a tutorial where Rebecca will give you an introduction on how to access, analyze, and apply the data that all of today's speakers have been talking about. So if, as you're watching this, you see cool data sets, cool tools, cool ideas, and you start thinking, you know, I could do something like that. Uh, we actually have a, a workshop to, to, to sort of enable anybody out there to, to carry forward with this type of work in their own in their own labs or colleges or basements or wherever you're doing your research. But so now with that, Joel, you have a very long title. So I'm gonna actually just read this one off the script. Joel is Associate Fellow of Learning in Machines and Brains at CIFAR, faculty affiliate at the Vector Institute for AI and Canada Research Chair in Computational Neuroscience at York University. And he'll be presenting learning from unexpected events in neocortical microcircuits. Do I have that correct? Did I miss something? 
No, and I'm finally going to answer your question, Keith, about uh, how representations change with more experience and familiarity. Okay, I'm excited. Um, take it away. So, uh, yeah, so first off, thanks to Keith and everyone at the Allen Institute for putting on this great symposium. It's been really fun so far, and I'm, I'm really stoked to get a chance to come uh, participate in this. Um, what I'm going to talk about for the next, uh, next few minutes is what happens in the animal's brain when they're surprised, like Pikachu here, uh, and consequently when they learn from that surprising and unexpected uh, event. Um, the data that I'm going to show is, is all in this preprint that we just put up on the bioarchive. Uh, the data are, are themselves are up on the Dandy archive and some code to help with analysis is here on, on GitHub. So feel free to dive in uh, if you're interested in, in sort of, uh, you know, seeing all the details. Okay. So the, this work sort of builds on, on a longstanding hypothesis um, in neuroscience, which is that the brain internally forms predictive models of the outside world. So the idea is that as you see a sequence, for example, like this one, you start to form expectations about what's gonna happen next. And when those expectations are violated, you learn something new about what the structure of the world is. In this case, uh, you learn after a while that this is not just a sequence of letters, there can also be, uh, be smiley faces embedded in it. And a longstanding idea going back 160 years now uh, to, to Helmholtz is that the brain learns from those mismatches between what was expected versus what actually happened, and that those mismatches cause a change to the brain's internal model uh, so that the, the predictions get better over time. And more recent uh, incarnations of this um, sort of reflect the hierarchy uh, of, of brain anatomy, so that the fact that there are different brain areas that work together to perform visual computations. Probably the most well known of these sort of recent incarnations or semi-recent is this Rao and Ballard 1999 idea. Uh, and there the, the idea is that within each brain area, for example, um, uh, for example, shown, uh, shown here, so V1 at the back of the head, there's a comparison between incoming data, uh, so the sensory input that's compared to predictions of what should happen in that area that are sent top down to that brain area. And the difference between those generates some errors that are then sent on through the hierarchy. So the idea is that somehow a comparison between top-down signals versus bottom-up signals uh, is a comparison between internal predictions versus incoming data. And we set out then to, in, in this, this project through the Allen Institute's open scope program, we set out to test the hypothesis that the brain is forming a hierarchical predictive model uh, and learning from errors in that model. And so that the first thing to do was to form some specific predictions. So if the brain is, is learning a hierarchical predictive model using the prediction er errors to learn, then the following things should be true. The first thing we would expect is that there should be distinct responses to expected versus unexpected stimuli. So the brain should know that they were unexpected somehow. The second thing we expect is that as there's increasing experience with these unexpected things, they should become less unexpected, right? The brain should learn from them by updating its internal model. And so we should see neuronal responses change over time with increasing experience. The third thing we expect is that if this is a hierarchical system, so there's a difference between top-down versus bottom-up information flow, we should see, see differences in the way the top-down versus bottom-up uh, circuitry in the brain changes over time. And the final thing uh, that we predict is if the brain is actually learning from the prediction errors, then we should be able to predict on a neuron by neuron basis how much they're going to change over time based on how strong their prediction error signals are. This is the idea that uh, strong prediction error signals might be predictive of large subsequent changes. So conveniently here, uh, so you know, a challenge to, to doing this, right, is that we need to be able to separately measure top-down versus bottom-up driven signals in the brain. Here, the anatomy of the brain actually does us a favor, which is that the top-down inputs to cortical pyramid cells, like this one show here, shown here, top-down inputs go to the distal apical dendrite. That's this thing um, sticking up to the brain surface, whereas the bottom-up inputs go to the basal dendrites down near the cell body. And so by putting the imaging plane of the microscope either at the brain surface or down at the cell body layer, we can separately record top-down versus bottom-up driven uh, signals in the brain. And that's what we did again in, in, this, um, in this paper. So the sort of core idea is that we exposed the mice to stimuli that were mostly very predictable with occasional unexpected events. 
like the, the sort of leaf showing up on this apple in this cartoon is the unexpected thing. We then tracked the bottom up or top down driven responses. So either the cell bodies or the distal apical dendrites uh, over multiple days while the animals gained experience uh, with these, these unusual stimuli um, and tested those four hypotheses or the four predictions from this hierarchical um, learning from prediction errors hypothesis. Okay. All right, so here's sort of the, the overarching experimental design. Uh, for a long period before the, before the recording sessions, the animals are habituated just to stimuli that have this very regular statistical structure. So it's just the expected stimulus. They see it for a long time. They should be able to form those internal predictions like a sequence of letters um, and start to, to anticipate what should come next. And then during the recording sessions, we break those uh, predictable structures uh, with rare unexpected uh, events. And while we're doing that, we record either the distal apical dendrites or the cell body activations uh, of either layer two, three or layer five pyramid cells in primary visual cortex of the mouse. Um, this is what some of those data look like. So if you, the upper frames here are the recordings at the distal apical dendrites. The so things that look like lightning flashes uh, are calcium signals in those distal apical dendrites. And then the imaging down at the cell body is stuff you've seen before. The little circular blobs uh, are the cell bodies of those pyramid cells. Um, and so these are what the raw data look like. We then extract the regions of interest uh, at each imaging plane that are either the cell bodies uh, for the, the deeper planes or individual branches of distal apical dendrite up at the brain surface. Uh, and then we, we uh, use a matching algorithm to find the same ROIs over all three days of the recording. And I should mention for the apical dendrites in particular, this is really hard, right? These are micron sized pieces of the brain. We're able to find the same ones in the same animal over three different days to track the evolution of how they respond. Okay, so uh, you know, what does the stimulus look like? I said it's pre mostly predictable with some unexpected events. The idea is that the stimulus itself is the sequence of Gabor patches, so A, B, C, D, followed by gray, where each of those sort of letters corresponds to a set of locations for these Gabor patches. So the A's you know, have, the, have this set of locations, B's are some other locations, and C's are some other locations. And then this repeats, A, B, C, D, gray. Now on each repeat, the orientations change. So you'll notice they're mostly vertical for the first repeat and horizontal for the second repeat. And the individual Gabor patches are slightly jittered away from that mean orientation. So the same pixel pattern never repeats within the, the stimuli. Uh, however, there's a statistical regularity where after you've seen an A with a given orientation, you know that the next frame is gonna be Bs. So the locations for the B, and it's gonna have approximately the same orientation uh, as the A. So the sort of rule that the, that the mice are habituated to before the experiment uh, is that there's this sort of predictability of what locations are gonna come up and the orientations mostly match between frames. And then during the experiment, we introduce these unexpected things where in place of the D, we put a U, so an unexpected frame that has a new set of locations. So the U locations do not match the D locations and the orientations are now orthogonal. So the U's have a, a orientation that's 90 degrees offset from the preceding ABC. So the unexpected thing is twofold. When the U comes up, all the orientations are different from what, what you would expect and uh, sorry, all the locations are different from what you'd expect and the orientation is off by 90 degrees from what you would expect. Um, uh, and yet, you know, nonetheless, the rules underlying both the ABCD gray, uh, so the lo locations and orientation matching for ABCD gray, that can be learned through experience. And similarly, the rules for the U's can be learned through experience, which is that sometimes instead of the D locations, there'll be other locations and sometimes the orientations will be flipped by 90 degrees. So it's not purely random, but has, has something that can be learned through experience. Okay. And then we can, of course, compare the responses to the uh, expected, like the D and gray, versus the unexpected, um, like U and gray. Um, this is what those look like. I'm just going to jump ahead a bit because there's this header that, that sort of describes the stem structure. Um, and you can sort of see what it looks like. So ABCD gray, when this thing turns red, it'll be an unexpected sequence. 
and you'll see then the orientation switches to by 90 degrees at the end. The stimuli the animals see do not have this colored patch or the letters at the bottom. That's just there to help cue you to, to what's going on. Um, and then here's sort of the experiment timeline again to remind you. So for about a week before we ever do the microscopy, the animals are exposed just to the ABCD gray stimuli. So they're habituated just to the expected thing. And then only during these three days where the brain imaging is done, uh, do they get exposed to the unexpected U frames. Okay. So the first question uh, to ask or the first hypothesis or the first prediction that comes from the hypothesis is do these unexpected stimuli induce distinct responses in the neurons? And we're looking here on the day, the first day they're exposed to them. What's shown here is the calcium signal for one particular neuron cell body in layer two, three, the S stands for SOMA. The blue trace shows the, the DFF, so the response to the unexpected ABCDU gray sequence. Uh, and the gray trace here is the responses to the expected ABCD gray sequence. This particular neuron responds more to the unexpected sequence. Blue trace is above the gray trace. And that's reflected by the positive value of this USI or unexpected event selectivity index. This is just the mean response to the unexpected events minus the mean response to the expected ones uh, divided by the variances. This is also known as a D prime metric, which tells you basically how well you could distinguish uh, expected from unexpected based on the neurons response. So this one has a positive USI. This other neuron ROI has a zero. This neuron doesn't care at all whether the stimulus is the expected or unexpected one. And this other neuron has a negative USI, so it responds less to the unexpected thing. Now for each neuron, we can uh, ask how significant these USIs are uh, by, by shuffling up all the labels of what we call expected versus unexpected in the data set and recalculating the USI. We do that 10,000 times for each neuron. That gives us this null distribution shown here in gray. And then we can ask whether the neuron's real ROI, a uh, real USI is, uh, is significant. In this case, by asking whether the real USI is greater than the 97.5 percentile point of the, the null distribution or less than the 2.5. Um, and this is what we see. So this is first the percentage of the U USIs that are significantly negative for each of the four imaging planes. Um, chance would be 2.5%. That's how many we would expect uh, by chance. And we see you know, substantially more that are, are strongly negative. For example, these two bars here uh, are for the layer two, three apical dendrites and somas. We also see uh, for each of those four imaging planes, many more strongly positive USIs than we would expect by chance. And that's especially true for the cell bodies, layer two, three and layer five somas uh, have, have many more strongly positive USIs than you'd expect by chance. And so the, the, the first sort of observation is that you tend to get stronger positive and negative. So, so more, um, more uh, substantial in a sense, our responses to the unexpected stimuli than the expected ones. Then the next things to ask are how these evolve over days. So remember we use here the, the ROIs that are matched over all three days of the experiment. And that's what's shown here. Each ROI corresponds to one line on this plot. The USI is shown for, for recording days one, two, and three. And for the apical dendrites, we see that these generally go up over time. Whereas for the cell bodies, we see that they converge pretty quickly towards zero. So on day one, there's some that are big negative and some positive. Uh, and by day two, the variance is much smaller and they're all concentrated around zero. That's reflected here in these plots that just show for the, this is averaged over ROIs, the absolute value of those USIs on each day. Um, and we see again, the same thing that for the, um, oops, for the apical dendrites, so the top down signals, uh, those go up over time, these uh, USIs and for the uh, cell bodies, which is driven by the bottom up signals in the brain, the, uh, these USI signals go down dramatically over days. Then the final thing to ask is whether we can actually predict on a neuron by neuron basis what that change is gonna be based on the, the unexpected event signal on day one. And so to do that for each ROI, we compare the change. So the difference between day two and day one, uh, change in the USI and compare that to the USI value on day one itself. That's what's shown in the scatter plot. 
Uh, and you can see that the, in blue is the real data and that's, that's strongly negatively correlated. We need to be a little bit careful in interpreting these data as is because we're comparing day two minus one to day one. And so even if there was no effect in the data, we would still intrinsically see a negative correlation just from the, the way we've done the comparison. Two minus one compared to one is gonna tend to be negatively correlated because the, the day one variable shows up twice. Um, so to see if the results are real and significant, uh, we again uh, use our shuffle control. So we shuffle the labels of what's called day two versus one, recompute this correlation, do that 10,000 times, that gives us a, a null distribution of what these correlation values would look like if there was no effect in the data. And then we can compare the, the real raw correlation to that null distribution to see if it's statistically significant. And in this case, it's, it's highly statistically significantly uh, more negative correlation than you would expect by chance. And then finally, we can quantify the magnitude of that, that sort of correlation beyond what would be expected by chance uh, with this formula. We take the correlation we observe, subtract off the median of the null distribution, and just divide by the distance between that median and the upper bound, which is either minus one or plus one, depending on which side of the null distribution the actual correlation lies. Um, so this is what we see over the four imaging planes. Um, for the apical dendrites, we see that between day two and day three, there's a statistically significant uh, positive excess correlation that tells us that the top-down signals, the apical dendrites that have larger unexpected event selectivity on day two, have larger increases between day two and day three. Similarly, uh, or I guess exactly the opposite, um, down at the cell bodies, so the bottom-up signals in the brain, we see statistically significant negative uh, correlations telling us that the um, ROIs that have a uh, bigger USI on day one have a bigger decrease in the USI between day one and day two. And so, you know, we set out to test this hypothesis that the top down and bottom up signals in the brain are learned differently based on unexpected events. Um, and, and we see the following. On day one, in, in response to an unexpected thing like the leaf in this image, uh, some of the cell bodies have positive and some have negative um, selectivity to that unexpected thing. With increasing experience, the cell bodies basically stop responding differentially to the unexpected thing, indicating that it is no longer unexpected. Um, and hence, we've, we've sort of colored in the leaf in this picture, reflecting the fact that the internal model um, now captures that leaf. The top-down signals, nonetheless, are increasingly selective uh, to, that, to that feature in the, uh, in the stimulus over time. Um, and so this is work uh, that came about because me and Blake and Tim and Yeshua here uh, collectively put in a proposal to the Allen Institute's open scope program uh, through which Jerome and his team at the Brain Observatory collected all these wonderful data for us. Uh, postdoc in my group, Jay Pina and Colleen Gillen, a grad student with Blake, uh, did most of the analysis and, and you know, all the uh, that stuff is up uh, available online. So thanks, thanks very much for your time. Joel, that was great. Um, I really, <laughs> it sort of fit perfectly with the trajectory of our questions. So um, we're a little bit up against the clock here. So I'm just gonna ask you one quick question from the audience and then point out again that um, these conversations can be maintained after the fact online. So um, Joel, do you see similar D over U differences in animals that have not undergone the unrecorded habituation sessions? Uh, I wish we could answer that question, right? So I, I would uh, speculate that we should see something different if there's no habituation. Um, we did not have, we don't have any animals that are not habituated. So the way the Institute's pipeline is set up, the animals have this long habituation period before the recording. And so uh, sometimes, you know, in principle, you could show no stimulus for that habituation period if you wanted we sort of opportunistically used that period to, to show them these statistically regular sequences to build the internal expectations. Um, but we don't know what happens if you take fresh mice sort of un, unexposed to any of the stimuli and plunk them down um, in, in the same setup. There's a little bit of data from that, that that's from a, a really related stimulus structure from Jan Homan and David Tank and others. Um, and there they see that with no previous habituation, you do see generally like bigger responses when the stimulus uh, sort of sequential structure is broken. 
There's a pretty big caveat though to, to those data that it make them different from what we did, which is they used exactly the same sequences. So every A is the same pixel values. So you're seeing A, B, C, D, gray, A, B, C, D, gray, and they're the same pixel values every time. And so part of the difference when they break that repeating structure uh, that they could be seeing is, is literally just depressing uh, structure of the feed forward synapses. So all of the synapses that are being activated by the A stimulus, they've been hit a lot by A, B, C, D, gray, A, B, C, D, gray. And so the cells basically stop responding and then the new stim comes in that hits new synapses basically un that are undepressed and then you get bigger responses. Um, and so those data are the closest to answering your question, but they're still not quite comparable to our structure with the, the sort of jittered um, orientations and differing orientations between sequences. I mean, I, I, I'm just gonna speculate for a moment here, but I, I like your, um, your experimental design a lot with the fact that it doesn't have common pixel values as the, as the sequences repeat because as you were playing that video, I was thinking to myself, as a human, could I be conscious of this? It's going by so quickly and they're so similar and it's not kind of a type of visual structure that fits anything that I can bring with a top-down lens. And so it really, assuming that the mouse's experience is anything like mine, that would suggest that whatever this kind of unexpected signal is, is really occurring at the level of that primary cortex and not some sort of feedback signal. I will say, uh, Keith, that you, you witnessed a brief bit of the stimulus and covering a small part of your field of view. Yeah. When I was programming these, you know, I watched these movies for like half an hour to make sure that everything was going right. And, and after a while, like, you know, and then for the mouse, it covers, you know, full, like the full field of view of one of their eyes. And so when you watch the thing for a long time and you're really like immersed in it, it pops out to you when the... the I wonder if it would pop out even more though, if you did the same thing with with an ethologically relevant structure that would have sort of a top-down discontinuity, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah. Op open question, yeah. Cool, Joel. Thank you very, very much. Um, so uh, we need to wrap. I don't know. If they care. It's Swiss clocks, right? So with that, we're we're almost at the conclusion of our program today, and I really want to encourage people to join us for the Allen Brain Observatory tutorial at the top of this hour, which is 11 a.m. Pacific time. And so let me just make a shameless plug for this. So when Tom and I came up with the idea for this whole symposium, we really wanted to take what we felt were disparate pieces of the Allen and disparate experience of the Allen and blend them into one thing. So, so often I've seen Allen Institute workshops where people can go learn how to use their tools. And then sometimes you'll hear talks from people like Joel or Saskia, but to actually have those dovetailed into the same symposium in the same event so that users around the world could have open access to this in a digital format, see how these pipelines are built, how the tools are built, how people at the Allen Institute are deploying all of those things to do cool independent science projects, and then even how people at exterior institutions are using those